Hey, we got numbers going. It's Cleveland Moto Podcast number 461. Light them up, boys. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, Dang, that Jesus. got some distance. Was that John? <laughs> yes. Man, that thing nearly hit me. <laughs> you can put somebody's eye out. It came out fast. A smallish crew today. Not small like last week, but small ish. Um, to my immediate left, not behind the bar tonight. Uh, Tom Bennington. Yes. And to his immediate left, Cider Steve Sleepy. And to his immediate left, Johnny Mackey Fresh. Johnny Mackey Fresh. And to his left, Pete Humphrey. All right. Uh, just wanted to say this week we were really hoping that we'd be into spring. We're not. We're into fourth winter. Yeah. yeah no shit. Shit. <laughs> it fucking snowed on the way to work this morning. <laughs> oh, man. It's just brutal. Uh, it's tough. And we've got all these bikes in the service department that all came in when the weather was nice. But now they're done, and yeah. nobody wants to come and pick them up. So I'm like, do you offer rental skis? Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do offer delivery. And uh, yep. so we've been capitalizing on some of the deliveries lately, too. Um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about, which is part, I was going to bring a bike here tonight so that everybody could try it out. And the bike mm-hmm. that I didn't bring out was going to be Brother Tim's bike. So uh, Pete's brother, Tim. Tell us how, because we did have Tim on the podcast right after he got the bike. So we were doing an outside crackle cast one night, and that bike, that's that that um, Zongshen, the RX3, I believe it came out one night that we got to look at it at least. I don't think anybody wrote it. And in fucks brother Tim. Yeah. <laughs> it fucks right into the scene. But anyway, the reason that I wanted to, uh, the reason I wanted to bring it out was. Tim has decided that he's had his fun with it. Now, when did he, how long has he had that? Because it's a, I think the bike's a 2015. Well, he bought it new, so yeah. Oh, he did? It. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. All right. So, yeah. Eight, so, eight years? Brand, brand spanking new machine. And the, uh, he asked me to help him liquidate it, right? Make it go away. And I don't think, and I asked him, I said, well, Tim, you've had this bike. You've done things to this bike. Give me a price. Give me an idea for a price that I'm yeah. going to sell this bike for. Because I mean, it's not a high dollar bike to begin with. Right? Well, this is going to weigh into the situation. Right. And that's why we're talking about it. Right. Because when I asked Tim, give me a price, Tim didn't give me a price. Tim said, well, just see what you can get for it. You know, kind of that deal. And then see what you can get for it, and then we'll work it out from there. Kind Tim, of Tim, here's your $20. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, and I mean, uh, so it is impossible. Now, I've got the, I got the, uh, image pulled up for our, our listeners out in the field so that they can see it. And uh, the bike is a made by Zongshen. And Zongshen, Chinese company, that has been building motorcycles for a long time. Zongshen! Zongshen! But Zongshen has built a lot of things. And for people who are not used to translating Chinese manufacturing into bikes we recognize... Uh, it would help you to know that many, many, many of the Piaggio products oh, over yeah. the years have been made by Zongshen, right? A lot of the stuff. So, yeah, it's uh, that's not going to be uh, John's. John's a sleepy boy. We're going to have. Yeah, we're not going to. We're not going to keep a whole long lot of John today. Well, uh, it's you know that that's when the what the Fly 150 when it lost the immobilizer. That was the first Zongshen that Piaggio sure. got. Yeah, there was all kinds of stuff, States. right? Yeah, lots. Of, there were just there have been various different permutations of that stuff, and the reason I want to bring that up because. I picked the bike up with 11,000 miles on it. It started perfectly. Like we took it out of Tim's garage and hit the button for one half of one second. And it just, duk, 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 just happy as fuck. It's a fuel injected bike. And I was like, okay, great. So I, I got on the bike and gave it a little yep. loop around, gave, you know, a little loop around the driveway there, put my ramp down and just fucking rode it right up the ramp into the back of the truck and didn't seem to have any problems whatsoever. And he gave me a box of takeoff stuff that, you know, he'd acquired and changed things, windshields and stuff like that over his ownership. Now, Tim, uh, tell us a little bit about the, the 11,000 miles that, or Pete, tell me about the 11,000 miles that this bike traversed. Uh, that's the bike he took to Baja, which was 2019. Actually, it was March of 2019, uh, which we talked about on the podcast back then. So... Uh, on that trip, we shipped the bikes to Vegas. We flew into Vegas, and then we f- rode down to San Diego, crossed into Baja, rode the length of Baja, and back up. And then when we got back into San Diego, we rode all the way back home to Cleveland from there. 
That was the biggest trip that bike did. <laughs> yep. That bike did. That's a big trip. I mean, anyway, you slice it. You well, rode... Oh, it, you rode Mex the Baja, Mexico, yeah. and you added Across America to that. Right. Right. Okay. And that's a 250cc bike. It is. Yeah. So, uh, especially so out, that bike paid for itself right there. I think it yeah. did. Yeah. Oh, right. absolutely. Oh, God. If you'd have been renting that bike, <laughs> you'd have been in trouble. <laughs> and we've been on a number of smaller like adventures, you know, and day rides, whatever, a couple hundred mile day rides here and there and whatever. But somehow it added up to 11,000. But I think the Baja trip was its, that was the crown and its jewel, or the jewel and its crown. Yeah. And it did fine on that trip? Yeah, absolutely. Tim didn't do fine, but um, the bike did fine. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to Tim? Well, okay, here, I, I tell the same story to everyone. Like, um, we were riding with a group from California, and they said, oh, some of this gets, there's a little bit of sand up here. Well, a little bit of sand to California guys, different from a little bit of sand to an Ohio guy. Yeah. And so Tim had a pretty steep learning curve there, uh, getting through the sand. I think he crashed like maybe three times that first day, just, just, fall over in the sand you know and then by the end of the week though i couldn't keep up with him so he figured it out oh he, he did figured up the okay. figured out the sand and stuff but uh so what's the move what like what's because like i've been in sand but i don't know about being in that kind of sand so what was the move to... just keep your weight back keep the front end light uh, don't fight it you know you don't want to wash out the front wheel or make it plow or anything and uh th your throttle's your friend and uh stay light on the peg or stay light on the bars and just keep your weight on the peg and Shift your uh, shift your weight around as so to sort of like bike. like deeper gravel then so kind of yeah exactly yeah okay. or it's like water skiing or like skiing in powder or anything else you know okay keep your tips up kind of thing <laughs> yeah I mean and it is too there's all kinds of different sand out there yeah and so you kind of feel it out and you'll figure out like okay this sand yeah or what's under the sand well that makes what, a big difference well we don't like if you come from the east coast and you're not used to any sand mm -hmm. even when you first start getting into it when you just get pockets of sand that's where it's actually scarier like i had the one time when i was getting out west and there was like in between the rock ravines there might be a foot or two of sand trapped yeah. in them yeah. and that's like an instant speed decreaser <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like really fast <laughs> break check yeah yeah so when he bought this bike, I think they were selling them for three thousand dollars, twenty nine ninety nine. Yeah, thereabouts, right? Yep. And so this was a liquid cooled six speed transmission motorcycle for twenty nine ninety nine, delivered to your door for I think thirty two twenty nine or thirty two ninety nine. Yeah, yeah. uh, and it just was one of those when they first came out. We said in our podcast, we're like, well, we're we're all going to take one of those cautious optimisms. Well, let's just let's just let's let Tim find out yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, this, uh, how it's going to be. Because none of us were plunking down our 3200 well, well, large. And also, yeah. you could spend seven or eight hours at night reading the forums. Yes. People that had these and guys that didn't have them and had their opinions. And oh my God, it was insane. Yeah. And that this, is the this, nicest possible way This to put becomes it. a long term test. Well, this it is, is a long This is a real long term this test. This is a real long term test. I was going to bring it by tonight so you yeah. guys could ride it. But. The uh, I'm not at all joking when I tell you I took it home, so I decided that if it was good enough for Tim, that it was good enough for me, and I was going to ride it home. And it turns out it's pretty fucking cool. <laughs> and uh, the way that I like to do on some of these bikes is I'll ride home to a certain point on my way home, and I know if I get off the highway, there's a railroad track there, and adjacent to the uh, Norfolk Southern Railroad track, there is what. There is a uh, service road, right? Allegedly. And there is not one sign, by the way, that tells you you're not allowed to be there. I've taken all of them down. I mean, if you there, were uh, to be there. <laughs> <laughs> I've made sure that there is nobody can ever tell me you're not supposed to be here. And, I, and I've, I've said, like, my concept is, well, it's, you know, this is public. This is the right of way or the, right. the siding for the railroad. So... That should be Bureau of Land Management's responsibility as far as I'm concerned. So, or you just play stupid. Say, that's generally what I, my general operating procedure is to play stupid. Yeah. Uh, I wrote it. I was like, yeah, it's pretty good. It's doing good. Uh, what I can tell you is it did not like the short amount of freeway that I did between McKinley and the first exit. Uh, I got through all six gears before I was going 45 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. I was well into top gear at 45. I got it up to about 60 and I had to look down at the tack because I was like, that's 10,000 RPM. It feels like 10,000 RPM. And I looked down at the tack and it was a lot of RPMs. <laughs> and I got it up to about 70. And at 70, I was like, whoa, I am really, it is me versus the wind right now. Yeah. And the wind was winning. 
And we had a wind coming out of the west, and I was going into it. Now, how fast have you seen this motorcycle go? Well, because <laughs> I've right. seen it go eighty, but that was <laughs> that was in my rearview mirror, and okay. he was like drafting me when I was on the BMW, and then um, I would draft him and then slingshot him up behind a truck on the interstate, <laughs> and um, he could hold the eighty behind a truck all day long. And know? he's not a big guy. I mean, he's not no, a big guy. He's uh-huh. real lean. Yeah, he's a real lean guy. And uh, once I got once I got off the freeway, I was like, "Wow, okay, that was that was intense." Uh, and then you do just remember you're on a 250, right? What's the best thing about sex when you're camping? It's intense. Yes, it is <laughs> intense. <laughs> so anybody above the ten dollar level got that joke. Yeah, that was a yeah. five dollar pad uh, punchline. <laughs> hey Phil, it's a picture of you. Well, yeah, so yeah, that is, yeah. I wanted to bring up because I decided that you know they have these piles. They have these piles of tailings. Yeah. So every so often <laughs> there's a pile of tailings that they use to bolster the railway bed, right? And they just lay them out there. Just have them setting out there. If anybody needs any uh, asphalt tailings, I know where to get them for free. Uh, I don't think Norfolk Southern in mind, but anyhow. So I just, I just was hitting the edges of those tailings to make little nice little jumps out of them. Just make a little, ooh, a little jump, and then go a little deeper. So a uh, son comes home and says, "Hey, Dad, I just lost my virginity," and the father says, "Oh, that's great." Here, sit down. Let's have a drink. He says, no, I can't. It still hurts. Ah! <laughs> Did he, was he coming back from church? <laughs> no. Yowza. Uh, so I did increasingly larger little bumps, like little, not really calling them jumps, right? <laughs> but bumps, right? And uh, I got to my third and most confident of them, and I went up in the air. And I went up in the air, and I was like, yeah, okay, now I'm actually in the air. And when I landed, the right rear saddle box <laughs> just jumped off the motorcycle. Your pannier? <laughs> My pannier became pannier airlines. <laughs> it was just, and the bike, I didn't, bo- I don't think I actually bottomed the suspension all the way out, but it was enough that on the rebound, the box just went, fuck <laughs> off. And I had to stop and go back and get it. And well, then I realized the bracketry system on those ain't exactly, you know, SW Motec. No. Yeah. But I was thinking, though, with his brother and the way it was set up, mm-hmm. I mean, like, I'm sure that suspension was fairly stiff for him. Yeah, it was. He's got, you have to have a stone on him. It least. wasn't real. It wasn't real stiff for me. It was pretty yeah, soft. that's what I'm saying. It was pretty yeah. soft suspension for me. And uh, so that was fun. I got to a little jump on it, kind of skidded around a little bit, did some, you know, did some slides, threw some gravel around, threw some dirt around. Because if you look at the kid in the picture that you have posted, yeah, he's eight. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, the, look in the helmet. The like, person in this, <laughs> the person in the shot is the lightest, smallest American they could put on this bike for that photo shoot. So you say you were riding it like you were selling it for somebody else. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. And you know, he's done some stuff to it. He put heated grips on it, which is actually pretty handy on the day that I had it because it was fucking cold. And uh, I did ride it the rest of the way home, and it did great, and it was fine. And so, you know, getting it home, and then I rode it to work the next day, uh, and riding it to work the next day, sometimes in my route, it's 18 miles of freeway, and this day it was three miles of freeway, because I was not going to do that again. I was like, okay, I'm going to ride Lake Road, take the scenic way most of the way in. But I wanted to say that after 11,000 miles, this is a solid bike. It's on the same motor it started with? Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah, I don't see any reason not to. I, I know the only thing it's done to is like valve, adjust, valve adjustments. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, don't, I don't think I ever replaced wheel bearings or anything else. Just, yeah, it was it. Kind of surprising. I mean, I, it, for uh, if anybody would have said this is a $6,000 motorcycle, I would have said, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. It feels like a bike with 10,000 miles on it. Sure, it feels like a bike. You also would have told me it had 2,000 miles on it. I would have believed that too. It wasn't sketchy. It, it wasn't shimmy. It, it didn't feel like garbage. It felt actually okay. It felt fine. It didn't feel like the Steve McQueen edition, it, but it felt like a motorcycle if somebody would said, this is what we're going to be riding. Somewhere between refined and primitive. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was a very interesting experience for me. Why did we bring that up? Well, we bring it up because they announced today that uh, the folks over at Lon Chin or Lon Sin or wherever you're from, uh, that their long-going partnership with BMW that goes yeah. back now many, many years yep. in various different ways, that Lon Chin is going deeper into that, and they are going to 
offer a long chin under the name Vogue, V-O-G-E. Now, you guys may or may not have ever heard of Vogue motorcycles. Really? But yes, so Vogue motorcycles. Dun, dun, dun. Well, because yeah. <laughs> one of the, I'm not going to lie, one of the first Chinese bikes I ever worked on was a Vogue 260. Correct. And it was the worst piece of junk so, I ever Well, because it was <laughs> launch in under yep. a different name. Yep. And that's where. Rakita. <laughs> well, and, okay, but. <laughs> that's going back. I promise you guys, when we were joking about like CF Moto, and Tom goes, oh, yeah, rrr, 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 right, right. Oh, yeah, I still have nightmares about the E-Charm. Exactly. So when we start thinking about stuff like that, well, launch in Vogue and BMW, it's going to be very hard to differentiate yep. where one bike's DNA stops and the next one starts when they're selling a 1,000cc BMW SR plant powered bike, right? Because they, they started with the G, what is it, the G450, but mm-hmm. not the X, the, the other two. Right, the country. Yep. Yeah. And so this... So because this is what this is, I, I want to say we're going to go, we're going deeper down the fucking well of, yep. I don't want a Chinese bike. Well, good luck. Yeah, at this point. Because if you've got a parallel twin BMW, you've been riding a Lan Chin. Well, and you've been riding a Lan Chin since it no longer said made in Austria on the side. Because that Rotex inspired... That was a partnership. Yep. And the partnership has gotten deeper, well, uh, deeper, ever, and deeper. Ever since the F800 came yeah, out, forget exactly. it. So, so this is the thing that this is the thing that we want to make sure that people kind of have an understanding about yep. because that's that to me is something that people should be aware of as we're going into these new markets because this is a thing. And the idea of a Chinese BMW S1000RR is something that people might think about, so, right? Because there is the SR, so the SR350 Adventure Scooter, which is part on, on the DNA of the BMW C400X, right? And they're looking at a 1600 GT, which is BMW's flagship touring yep. bike, right? And Vogue already has the DSR900X, so the DSR 900X is a BMW engine. That's the 900, the BMW 900 motor. So by brand engineering, you can have BMW over here, you can have Vogue here in the middle, and you can have Lan Chin over here. Because a lot of people use Lan Chin. Lan Chin's oh, name yeah. appears on a hell well, of what do you a lot think, of stuff. If you back engineer that deal... Mm-hmm. So BMW must be getting motors for just insane prices or something to give away that much of their brand. Because like, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. that's gonna people are gonna, like some of the purists are gonna take that in a very hard way as this develops. Well, I think BMW doesn't have purists. BMW has people that buy a lot of very expensive gear and want to hang out in front of a Starbucks. Except for the guy who's sitting at the end of the table over <laughs> yeah. there who's actually now, been to all the BMW training schools and has several BMWs. And, <laughs> yeah. and, right. Come on, I have an eleven I have an eleven fifty rotting in the garage. And walks. <laughs> yeah, but the his walk. does like what they're I know, made to do. I know. Right. God, I never want to see that bike again. I tr- I actually att- never I have just, a customer supply a motor because that thing was crap. <laughs> I just I, I'm just trying to figure out like like what the benefit would be like unless it is just monetary oh it's money i mean that's yeah it has it's to be. all money BM, maybe, BMW maybe it's is knowing like a, your audience man yeah. maybe it's knowing your audience bmw maybe. has been building garbage cars for 30 years i don't know why they wouldn't move it to motorcycles <laughs> because they're known for i mean like you know like they're the pinnacle of bikes basically. but maybe that's why you don't do it under bmw's name yeah maybe that's why you use vogue yeah. a company that's sacrificial <laughs> but in other countries where somebody cannot throw thirty two thousand yeah. dollars at a sixteen hundred GT, well, maybe they can throw eighteen thousand dollars at a Vogue sixteen hundred GT. Yeah. Right? And it doesn't have everything that the BMW has, but if you take it apart, then we're gonna discover. Remember, KTM? KTM's pretty fucking rad. Well, we're already at the point now where it's going to take looking at the numbers on the side of the case, the laser engraved numbers on the side of the case, to know whether your KTM has a Chinese-made motor right. with a made in Austria on the neck of the bike or whether it has an Austrian-made motor. 
I what? guess the real question is at what point do you start saying, ooh, I want the Chinese motor because it's better <laughs> than well, the Astro. Well, it's, I mean, I, w- that's I the, would never. That's the real question. I would never, but at some point, I mean. I well, it's, we were, I was having, now, to kind of bring this back around, we were talking about cars earlier with another friend of mine, and we were talking about which Lexus is built in Japan versus the Lexus that's built here in Tennessee or wherever. And this is sort of that same idea of, at what price point are you buying a Chinese mm-hmm. BMW, which is the F800? Well, I just bought my car. It says it's a Kia. It says yeah. made in. It's made in Alabama. No, it says nope. made in Korea. Ah. But I think that's because it was the hybrid. It may have been made in Korea. Yeah. But which which do you want more? The one that was made in America that's, or made in Korea? That's I, the problem. Is because when you when you're buying an, an American car. You're still buying an, an accumulation of parts that have been built in 2,700 different countries, mm-hmm. and the origination is either in Alabama or Korea. So that's the that's what it comes down to. When you're talking about a KTM, you know what po- do they assemble it in Austria still with with Chinese parts? So I'm going to throw a picture up, and then we're going to ask people who know things about motorcycles. Mm. We're going to say where. And what is this motorcycle? It's like, do you want an American car or a Japanese car? Right. Well, if you get a Camry, it was a Japanese car made in America. My Honda Element was built right down the road. Correct. <laughs> so, <laughs> interesting. So, when we... I, I just pulled a picture up of, of you know, a motorcycle that's pretty easy to acknowledge, or pretty de- easy to recognize. I love Japanese, you know, made motorcycles like KZ900s and Goldwings <laughs> that are made in Japan. Not no. no, the Goldwing, yeah, Nebraska. So the Goldwing was right Ohio. down here, yeah, right, Nebraska. Well, because we had this conversation earlier about the about the uh, Zongshen. It has a very much V Strom XT look to it, but everybody has adopted the beak and the and the funny eyebrows. Schnabel. So Schnabel. What's, what's this motorcycle that's that we're looking at? Well, it's a Yamasaki. <laughs> it's a parallel twin nine hundred. Yep. First things first. Um, I see a lot of BMW DNA. What do you? How do you feel about that, Pete? Oh, I, at first glance, I thought it was a BMW. Me too. Uh, yeah. No. First, the first thing when I looked at that motorcycle, the very first thing when I saw that motorcycle, I swear to God, I was like, "It's a 2002, a 2022 BMW 900." You know how I can tell it's not? Go ahead. Those tires have tubes in them. Those are not the tubeless. Be- well, no, wait. No, no, they're not. Those are tubeless. Look hang at on, the hang things. on. Do they have the, the spoky yeah, dogs? They, they have spokes? external spokes. Yeah. Yeah. External okay, spokes. those are the BMW yeah. spokes. Yeah, that's why I'm saying is like, yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me if somebody says, okay, if it says BMW on the side, it gets tubes. It gets cheap tires. It gets cheap wheels. It gets cheap tubes. But when I look at this motorcycle, I see a hell of a lot of the same stuff. But it's so weird though, because like if you look, it has like part of a Yamaha where the rondel is looks Yamaha, the headlight looks Yamaha, mm-hmm. the the cases and the wheels look BMW, it's, the snozzle looks kind of like Honda actually, like one you, of the NC have versions. Have you have you seen the V Strom XT? What? A, yeah, that too. That's yeah. that's that. that yeah. Everybody else is kind of going after that XT look. It's it's hysterical to say that because the XT is not a very popular model. Isn't uh, China? But everything's kind of going after that. Going to fuck themselves eventually if you're like KTM. And you have China build KTMs, and you design them, and you give them everything, and then, like in two years, they start coming out with your same bike, pirated. That's we do. We know people okay, that so happened to. So yeah. and then that starts happening to BMW, right. and then that starts, ha- and then it's like, well, wait a second, we can't have them build our bikes anymore because if we give them the bikes to build, they're just gonna build them for a couple years, and then you're you're of an age, pirate them. Do you remember the Dodge Colt? The first Dodge Colt. Yes, I do. Uh, I do you remember who built that? No. Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi. Yeah. yeah. And now everybody, well, now Mitsubishi's made a horrible name for themselves, but before everybody was all in on Mitsubishi. So you had this, the Colt and the Sapporo. I don't have problems and, with that. But this is what you're talking about. Did, is the, the, thing, the, the problem I have with China is that they're a military near peer, and mm, you yeah. know what I mean. Yeah. Like we're funding, well, not really, but yes, they are absolutely. I oh, fucking I think, guarantee. Yeah. It. <laughs> I 100. percent You know what, Tom? I'll Uh-oh. let you slide on a Uh-oh. lot of shit, but when it comes that down one? to when it comes down to if I get activated, and it ain't gonna fucking happen. Um, <laughs> but if if I had to go out there and face an enemy, oh yeah. I sheer numbers, do, yeah. No, it's not sheer numbers. It is technological. I uh, bad news, bad news bears, guys. All the drones that are taking out the entire Russian fucking armored forces 
are made in China. That's true. Okay? That's where battles are going to be won in the future. True. And if you don't think that China already has swarm drone technology, and if you don't think that China already has the ability to throw lots of high, well, moderate high-tech aircraft at the problem, yeah, I, I think we, well, this, near peers the best I mean, possible work for it. If, if, China, if, well, if China goes to a war economy... Right. And stops Nobody making can, oh, yeah, stops he, making silly yeah, motorcycles and cars and building military. There were we were yeah. in thir- in what thirty eight. So yeah, no, I wonder if up. there's a way that a company, I mean a country. I wonder if there's a way that a country could monetize and build an amazing high tech manufacturing base beyond their normal station. Not just building bicycle frames anymore with motors on them. Wonder if there's a way that somebody could get to elevate their manufacturing to cutting edge Western level technology or German level technology or Japanese level technology and could make their factories that fucking good, but on somebody else's dime. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. That would be China. Because when BMW is drawing the plans and BMW is paying the bills yeah. and BMW is designing the equipment, the tooling, the machinery and has the engineers there. And when John says, Oh, well somebody got pissed off and the switch got flipped. Now that factory that BMW paid for is churning out the highest possible tech near peer adversarial weapon system in staggering numbers, in staggering numbers because labor's never been a problem for them. Sure. And we live in a country where getting labor has become very fucking difficult. Yeah, but I heard in 10 years that's going to flip for China because they're an inverted society. They are an inverted society, but right now they can they can currently produce they can currently produce 1,000 times the 150 millimeter shells than we can on our best day. Yeah, right. But I'm saying like, right. okay, take the war out of it. I'm saying yeah. like involve with like making things. Yeah. Like in the next 10 years, they're not going to be able to supply the factories with workers. Basically. I think they will. You think? Yeah, I do. I do. they're not. They'll so, go through the same revolution. I mean, it's just, you know, they're talking about a 32 hour work week right, here. Right. Well, they'll just go through automation and AI and all this stuff right. to where the average, they, they may have less workers, but those workers will be like American workers who are 400% more productive and mm-hmm. still getting paid the same. Right. And that's, that's one of the things that's always concerned me because I've seen this amazing shift. In a very short period of time, CF Moto went from being drag. Shit yeah. we didn't want to work yep. on to having KTM knock on their door. <laughs> hey, uh, y- 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 we'll give you all the engineers. We'll give you all the tooling. We'll give you all the technology. Can you make those motors for us? Because we heard you can make them just as good for mm-hmm. uh, one quarter as much money. Mm-hmm. And I like profit. And we like selling more bikes. <laughs> so if we could have more bikes that are more affordable to more people... If anybody's looked at KTM numbers recently, KTM used to be like, oh, yeah, and at the end there, over there, we got yeah. KTM. Yeah. And KTM, KTM has moved up to the point where KTM is giving Yamaha concerns <laughs> as, as far as volumes of units sold, mm-hmm. well, right? And, the, yeah. you know, I'm the CEO. I really enjoy getting $10 million a year, but right. if I could get $250 million a year by moving everything to China, that, that'd be really Oh, cool. yeah. So when we see QJ doing you know mv agusta things right you don't do mv agusta things with the factory that built roquetas <laughs> yeah you don't you don't you cannot afford to do mv agusta things well, with the factory that built fucking roquetas or hawk 200s or whatever you need to in, you need to modernize you need to increase the capabilities of that factory now wouldn't it be great if you could do that using somebody else's money because when lan chin shakes hands or Lon Sin shakes hands with BMW, Lon Sin's not paying the tab. Yeah. BMW's paying the tab. That's that's money from Germany coming into China and technology from Germany going into China. So that's where I'm a teeny weensy bit concerned about how could China blow right the fuck past us? Mm. Mixing super high tech capabilities that other countries pay for and a workforce that will not fight for seven fifty an hour, right? That's scary. It should be scary. 
You know, it's one of those things. And also, we are lucky enough in this particular country that we haven't had to stare down the barrel of uh, the local car dealership down there. Marky Mark Wahlberg has not yet started selling Geely's or BYD's. Well, no, but Buick's been selling Chinese mo vehicles and, here since 2007. And, but, you know, 1997. And, and Volvo's part and parcel owned by, what, Keyway? Keyway. Yeah. But you know what? I'm starting to see, yep. what are those Jeeps that they can't get street Oh, Mahindra. Yeah. But they're, Mahindra's. Yeah, because they're at all the big, all oh, yeah. the big implement yeah. shops out by my house. Would you look yeah. at all the Buick Encores and those little compact SUVs yeah. made in China? Yeah. Yep. Right. So, that's, that's the thing is, we might be, in that case, well... We might be a couple of years away from having because Daihatsu made a go of it and then didn't. Daihatsu can make a go of it because at well, the time, our trading status yeah. with them. It's silly that we still buy so much stuff from. There's a billion other right. places. We could right. buy stuff from anybody else that's not a military near peer. Yep. Invest in India, invest in Taiwan, Indonesia, anything. Yeah. I don't care about the money. Like, just stop giving it to China. Well, that's, that's, Nobody's got the price point. Yeah. <laughs> come on. Turns come out, on. Turns out all the people in charge of those companies, you talked about earlier, they like profit. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about we this. Need and to and one, of the, one of the biggest president, one of the two presidential candidates coming up talks shit about China, but gets all of his shit made in China at the same fucking right. time. Right. So. Yeah, it's, it's that, that's that something that we should be aware of. When the stories, when I was calling the interne internet this week, for motorcycle <laughs> news stories, the vast majority of motorcycle news stories that I found were announcing and extolling the virtues of Chinese manufactured Oof. goods, Chinese manufactured motorcycles. In fact, Cycle World magazine, I was gonna do a, I was gonna do a burn today on here's Cycle World's magazine's twelve stories that they launched this week. Ten of them were about Chinese made motorcycles, and they were like, the sun shines out of this bike's ass. This is the greatest <laughs> motorcycle we've ever ridden. And you should go out and buy one right now, even though there aren't any dealers that sell them. Hmm. Tran transistorized radios are the future. Well, how fucked up, how fucking scared should you be when a national publication starts telling you that this is the greatest bike in the world, you should <clears> go <throat> buy one right now, yet there aren't any in dealers anywhere. Yep. So they're using their marketing power, they're using their money <clears throat> to promote a product that isn't in a dealership that you can go buy yet. Hmm, I wonder what's coming next. It, I just read an article about China. It was like the, the uh, it's basically the drop number two that China is pulling right now is they're flooding the market with solar panels, electric vehicles. Yep. They yep. started and they're and they're just now it's like electric. If you look, solar panels yeah. are going to come way down, yeah. and it's just it's going to gut everybody else's industry. And that's it's it's like steel dumping. You know when they started dumping steel yeah. and dumping all that. So it's almost the, like we needed. It's the, a, it's the second shoe falling. It's it's almost like we needed this partnership with Asian countries as far as manufacturing goes that controlled and regulated back and forth and and made sure that they China couldn't dump on the United States all of this stuff. But somehow that didn't happen. <laughs> no, that's, I, again, watch that. You know, just be aware of that because I think that to a lot of us, I don't think we'd be a whole lot happier. The only thing that would make me happy and the, the, the hope is, though, is that they're going to come out and they're going to invest all this money and they're going to dump all these electric vehicles and everything. Yeah. And then the industry is going to be like, hmm, that doesn't really make sense. We're going to do hydrogen fuel cell. Or that it's going to move past them. It's, it, if, they, if they dump it here, it'll be cheap. If they dump it here cheap, it's going to win. Right. Other problem is that China has been dumping electric powered cars into their own problem, their own situation. If you do want to do a YouTube search, look for unsold Chinese EVs. Yeah. And if you look at that, you'll see factories that have 12,000 unsold Chinese vans mm. in the factory and dust, dirt, an inch and a half high on it. And then at multiple different yards in multiple different fields thousands and thousands more of them and each one of those counts as a unit sold by byd or geely whoever so they can say we're the number one producing yeah. chinese uh, we're the number one producing electric vehicle manufacturer fuck you tesla look at how many we sold so they but the point is yeah. they didn't sell them they produced them and they're not they're not being driven around. See, this this was that this was that mentality when they started building really cities with nothing in them, and then the buildings started falling down. Because and tofu they, drag, yeah, tofu drag gets you. Yep. All right. So back on to something else we can't have. Oh, uh, I'm very <laughs> happy to see people having fun with right. the monkeys. Right. Oh. Right. Because there is a product we all absolutely love and love dearly, and it's super fun and cool. 
and uh, there's this group, and you should be you should be watching or following Cub House Honda. Cub House Honda has a sense of goddamn humor about itself, <laughs> and they are making Buku limited editions, Buku limited editions, and they are doing one of them is the Star Wars monkey, where you get to choose the light side or the dark side. If you get the dark side, you get an LED lightsaber with a red lightsaber blade uh, to come as your, you know, your keychain or what have you to go with your fun monkey bike. And if you choose light side, you get a very um, R2-D2 looking uh, motorcycle that comes with a lightsaber with a blue blade on it. Fucking fun, hilarious, <laughs> super cool. Um, you want to get kids into riding motorcycles? Yep. That's how, they're, they're right there. That's that's pretty fucking cool. Um, absolutely love light side, dark side monkeys. Kids, kids are like 50 year old dudes. Yeah. Well, oh, because because yeah. we've been getting Star Wars marketed us since 1977, yeah. and all we're saying is more, mm-hmm. please. Uh, no, absolutely no doubt about it. Just please give me more of that shit. Uh, I when Honda doesn't build the special edition that you want, it turns out you can. You know what? You know what's going to be kind of sucky for kids. Like so, for us, when Star Wars came out, right? Like there was nothing before. Like that was like. Holy shit! Like there was lasers and there's spaceships flying through the air. Like, <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like we'd never right, seen that. Yeah. So what kind of a movie could come out now where kids would be amazed by it? Like they, it would what, have to be because they've seen everything. Through do you CGI remember a few stuff. years ago the yeah. the the thing around uh, the Avengers when they finally can't build up to the final crescendo and now everything has kind of been kind of that is kind of their Star Wars moment. Is what okay. I mentioned. All right, I'll give and then that. you've also got the younger kids that are into fro. You know, girl. You know, well, I say girls, but. Frozen was a was a huge cultural moment. You, you know, there yeah, no, there are daughters, cul- dude, yeah. exactly. You have a daughter, so you know that there are cultural pieces. But I don't think. But it wasn't something that they hadn't seen before. It was well, yeah. just a big. It was a big. There was lots of big movies, but I mean, like Star Wars was a new it thing. Created its own niche, but that's the question. Is yeah. and I get it. I get it. I, what, what haven't they seen? And that might be fall down to there's nothing new under the sun. Well, until you introduce lasers, you could kind of <laughs> say like those Avatar movies. Those yeah, were kind of because that was CGI. Yeah, that might yeah, be that yeah, yeah, kind of. They're bad. supposed to be Disney, or I think it's Disney supposed to be building a whole new Avatar world, like yeah. this whole immersive going, experience. Gone big. Wow. The uh, it, it, so the another. Let's go into yet another thing we're not oh, allowed yeah. to have. Uh, since we're doing things we're not allowed to have. Meckle Fresh has been trying to have this thing for fucking ever. <laughs> I can't, my cheeks uh, are so pudgy, I can't even right. make the jerk off. The, uh, <laughs> the Dax, uh, the Dax <laughs> is the Dax is back, but we just need to get it over here, man. We just well, need it, to get it. it took them a while to get the monkey. This is this is right. on the way. We just got to get. They it just got to figure out how to get it here. Just just get can it somebody make That's the jerk off sound for me? Which is hey. so weird because you would think that they're just taking all the same mechanics and throwing them on a fucking different pressed metal frame. Oh yeah. Like what? What's the holdup? And that gives me faith. That gives me faith because the line from Grom, yeah, to Super Cub, was like mm, year, two years. Yeah, and then the line from Super Cub to Monkey or Hunter Cub was like seven months. Yeah, year and a half. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So I, I, I feel pretty it's good. I, I, I just I feel pretty good about. Well, yeah. the good news is, by the way. All we're talking about is the United States, because the rest of the planet's got this. Yeah. So bullshit. Honda but, USA. But the rest of the planet didn't get the Hunter Cub. That's right. I mean, it, it was selective where they got right. it. It was selective. That's exactly right. That uh, is exactly it's... right. And I do think that I think the DAX is a really I think the DAX is an excellent thing for the American market because uh, if you didn't notice, Americans can tend to run a little thicker. Mm-hmm. We tend to run just a wee bit thicker. It's the only one that's two up capable. I, it is, it, and it's it exactly, it, and it's the biggest one I think for the states. Yeah. If you were like of the age of ten or so in the late seventies, mm-hmm. the the fucking the Trail seventy was the bike oh, yeah. we saw first. No, my, my more than a Cub, more I mean more than anything like that's that. one of the first bikes I rode. My cousin had yep, a brown too. one, like a a garbage brown one. Yeah. It's uh, it is undoubtedly the one that. Yeah. Definitely was like yeah. 
And I don't know whether it's there's that angle of like, well, we're not allowed to have it, so I want it more. Yeah, I don't know. I think it was just ubiquitous it's, with like as soon as motorcycles. I, I mean, yeah. I you know I've I've had I had like a red the red cat version and the mm-hmm. and uh, what is it Ice Bear has their version right. and all that stuff mm-hmm. you know and they're they're all right they're cool it's beats buying a thirty year old one that you got to restore to ride right but yeah. having being able to walk into a Honda dealer and buy this stuff right. You yeah, know, it's especially really, when it looks like a really attractive. You know, 76 you know AMF Sportster. Though? You know <laughs> yeah. what's crazy, though? Like, so, like, yeah. I've, I've had, like, one of the shitty, you know, like, the ones you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. And, and it, it worked, and it did what it was supposed oh, to yeah. do. But I'll tell you what, John's, like, like beat-up-ass, whatever, 1980, whatever. You hit the gas, and that thing pulls, like, a fucking, like, 10 horses are strapped <laughs> to the fucking... Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's something very different about the Honda it, compared to the other ones. It shocks right? me how many, like, 1992 red ones there are that pop up still. Like with no miles on them. Yeah. yeah. Mine's actually an 82. 82. That's well, there's, it. no, uh, yeah. yeah. But like, there's like, they didn't even know they released them, but there's like right. an, a bunch of 1992 red. Yeah. That's where I've had customers that had them. Yeah. And I promise you, I've taken them apart. They're not oh, made yeah. in Japan. Uh, <laughs> so they're Honda, they have Honda badging on them all over but them. They yeah. were sold at Honda dealers. It's like I, black I, handlebars and stuff. Yeah. Taking them. I've had, had them through the shop many times. They are not made in Japan. I, I promise you that is another one of those CF Moto deals there you go. where you're like, look, it's really a Honda Helix. And are you're they, like, that is not a Honda Helix. Do you think you're Kimco? That is, is a, that would have been the Kimco era. No, it wasn't. It was CF Moto era. Ah, uh, okay. So, it was CF Moto era. So new, uh, another a news item. This is, yeah. But this is, this is, we need a drum roll for this. Uh-oh. This is mid-Ohio news. Uh-oh. Well, my God, my friend, tell me more. Not only is Mid-Ohio going to be the usual awesome, great time that Mid-Ohio is usually, and not only is there going to be the normal racing that we're so used to seeing, all the great stuff that we're used to seeing, they have brought the dun, bagger dun, dun, racing dun, to Mid-Ohio. They dun, bring dun, a Moto, Moto's America's bagger racing dun, exhibition. Dun, dun, dun. Bagger hair scrambles. Woo! <laughs> but I'm excited, yes. man. If you guys have not watched it, it is fucking really entertaining. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's pretty rad. It's uh, it's definitely a different mindset of road racing. It's the way it used to be. It reminds me of the old AMA Superbike days when, like, the guys were really going balls at each other, mm-hmm. like scraping paint, getting it done. Like, it's, it's uh, good. it also to me it reminds me a lot of the Battle of the Twin Series bots, mm-hmm. like the old Battle of the Twin Battle of the Twin Series. Where you're like, okay, well, we've created a class for Ducati, mm-hmm. and we invite all the rest of you to participate too. With whatever you've got. Mm-hmm. Honda's like, we can build a Super Hawk really quick. Honda's like, we can build a VT1000, I promise you. Suzuki did a, T, uh, a TL1000. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, companies were like, we'll play. Yeah. We'll play. And this silly bagger thing, they kicked the door open for Harley because Harley needed something that they could be competitive in other than Flat Tracker. Right. And with bikes that you couldn't buy. Right, because right? nobody's watching flat track going. I'm going to buy one of those next week. Right, because <laughs> it's been pretty much factory specials for a really, really long time. Yeah. and I was very, very much impressed the first time I saw the you know the bagger class, the bagger racing. I was like, ah, oh, okay, I get this. And it took Indian exactly one year. Oh yeah. To to go. Oh yeah, we can do that. Mm-hmm. And it turned into the whole Battle of the Twins series thing again, mm-hmm. where it was just like, okay, oh, if anybody would like to come in, this is existing technology. You do not need to hire a space shuttle team to build a Well, and that's what's bagger. interesting. So why isn't right. Yamaha and some of these other guys jumping in? They have the Star Series, right? And all the other stuff. They oh, could- there's going to be a Goldwing. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get a pass. It's going to be an F6B. And it's going to get an allowance on the whole, like, you know, displacement rules or something. Just based, because you're right. You're right. There's no reason not to. It's not my bag, man. What are the rules? If it's rules? a bagger class and you have to you let know, all the baggers. You know, out. right. I'm, well, I'm, I'm waiting for the Honda Shadow. Okay. There's going to be a Honda Shadow. We've got to look up which the rules. Which there rule. should be. A there VTX, should be. why the fuck not? Yeah. Why the fuck not? Ooh, a VTX 1800 probably rocked that. Okay. So or what's the Yamaha, this? the big racy, the, the MT-109? Isn't that kind oh, of that's a... that's a Suzuki. Uh, that's that a Suzuki? Suzuki. Yeah, Suzuki MT-109. Oh, okay. M109. Yeah. Sorry, M109. But okay. But fuck yeah, bring it on. They all have big V-twins. Yeah. yeah. None of these companies don't have big V-twins. Trans going to bring the Rocket 3. Trans could bring the Rocket 3. <laughs> <laughs> 2.5 liters of power. <laughs> hey, 
again makes it more interesting. It does. Yeah, right? Like like you want a lot of people makes involved it in more this. More interesting. Okay. Um, Mid Ohio's 2.4 mile road course with its legendary keyhole and carousel sections has a fresh coat of asphalt and is ready to welcome a full slate of vintage road racing during VMD. Classes will include hand shifted pre war racers, non current super bikes, modern machines, and everything in between, even sidecar rigs. Honda monkeys? During the parade lap of history. Yeah. Yes. The parade race of history. Uh, <laughs> the, but I love that where he goes. For this year, the program will shake the ground in a new way with the addition of big V-twin engines and the visual spectacle of full-fared bagger motorcycles at speed. Now, there is a lot of chicanery, (laughs) right? You know, what sort of fuckery is this? Because you look at the baggers and you go, hmm, okay, I, I see that. I see the frame. I recognize that particular frame. I recognize that particular motor. That swing arm doesn't belong on that motorcycle. Mm. Those forks don't belong on that motorcycle. Um, I'm pretty sure the bags are made of stiffened saran wrap. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're carbon fiber <laughs> shapes. Um, that I, took them one year. The first year, it was all real motorcycles. Right. Yeah. By the second yeah. year, it was all this. It was all this. Yeah. It, was, it was all just like, okay. Like the bags were falling off. They were really like... Yeah. Oh, they are. It's NASCAR now. Right? Yeah. You yeah. can take a NASCAR apart with your hands. Well, yeah. And the yeah. bags, if you look at them, they're only five inches long because they right. want the clearance. Yeah. And they I'm the, still... Again? Oh, I'm here for it. I'm here it. for it. Yep. Man. I don't care. Man, somewhere Eric Buell is just pissed. <laughs> Well, yeah, the right, crazy, right? Right. Yeah. right. <laughs> the guy who was building right. ahead of time, yeah. right? Yeah. I just, I, I love it because like the aerodynamics are so bad that they get unsettled in the corners and the shit gets <laughs> wiggly and yeah. it's, oh, it's so good. Yeah. When, and you look at Yamaha, Aprilia, God, Aprilia right now, the amount of active aero on an Aprilia is terrifying. Mm-hmm. And this is the opposite of that. Get oh. out there, Moto Guzzi, California. Yeah. Right. This is right. Right. what you're made of. This yes. is where I was going. Again. Get a cylinder down. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> yeah, could, couldn't they just run a caster? Oh, yeah. Like a little caster just wheel? Just a wheel. <laughs> just a little skateboard wheel out there. Yeah. It's a four-wheeled... Ve- it's a three-wheeled vehicle, only in the turns. Yeah. <laughs> only in the turns. Get that... What's the, what's the big... We'll uh, get a sidecar classification for the turns. What's that big one that looks like the fucking Death Star? That's the one. We're yeah, talking about the saying. MG... The MG21X. There you yeah, go. The Motor Guzzi MGX21. <laughs> uh... Yeah, just get out there. It's got a freaking cow catcher on the front, it's just running everybody out the road. All you have to do is take an he angle. He stands grinder. it up at the beginning of the straightaway. Yeah. Wah, just, bah, just three, take an angle grinder and cut everything off at a forty-five degree angle. <laughs> Lay some more carbon fiber in because the M, the, the Moto Guzzi MGX twenty one is all carbon fiber anyway. And you look at this, and it looks so weird with a seventeen inch front wheel. It looks yeah. so fucking yeah. weird. It looks very weird with the 17 What do you think you're... Su- I mean, could that be successful? If you somehow... Oh, there's a crashed one, and you bought it up for relatively cheap, and you did some... And you did the work. You, have, you think... It wouldn't probably cost a whole... I mean, $10,000, right? <laughs> and you could probably be very sure. competitive in will that. You, will you take a check? <laughs> I... I <laughs> I really do think that <laughs> this does actually kind of open the game back up into, hey, so you want to go race motorcycles? <laughs> I know where I can find a crashed street glide, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and it's worth Oh, nothing. the front end's fucked up with that. We're tearing that oh, off yeah. anyway. That's great. I got a set of Dexter forks to go right on that. <laughs> so when you, when you do explore this particular fucking wackadoodle part of motorsport, right, it... it it's initially, you guys remember two years ago, I was like, this is the dumbest thing that's ever walked on the planet, and I don't think it should be allowed to exist. I think we should kill it now before it mates and reproduces. Nope, too late. You can go to your <laughs> fucking Indian dealer, and if you have enough money 92 G's. If Good you God. have 92 G's, if you have $92,229, you can click the button that says, have a dealer contact me. And they will sell you a racing motorcycle. I wonder if they vet you. Like, do you have to have your license? Nope. It's not a Ferrari, really? man. Come on, dude. <laughs> you have to have $92,000. First, $92, first of all, in the picture I'm looking at, I see DOT tires. Okay? This, the, here's, this is my 
now's your chance to to own the two-time championship winning bike of the Mission Food Kings of the Baggers Race Series. Built for the speed and on-track performance of unparalleled power and race customizations designed to put you at the top of the podium. This is a homologation type project. This is them saying, we don't need to build 20,000 CBR 900 RRs but we built need enough to be in the cast. I think Indian might be leaning into something about like the king of the baggers. I think Indian was like, Hey, we're so good at this. We can build a homologation special mm. and Harley's going to have to go, well, we can build one too. Can't we guys? Can't, can't we, can we do that? Because they might, they might have to. Why I think this is so fucking amazing though, is turnkey racers. Like the idea of just saying, hey, look, I got a hundred grand. I already own a trailer. I've got some kind of racing license or I'll go get one. Mm -hmm. And I can be competitive with this machine. They didn't build one of them. They built 29 of them so far. They'll build more, I'm sure. Yeah. Right. I'm sure they'll build more. <laughs> well, right? There's money involved. Right. There's we'll exactly. That. <laughs> right. Once we find 28 We just people, talked about BMW right. going to China. Right. Victory's well, uh, victory. Indian is gonna get now, the money too. No, not for nothing. But I've thrown a lot of money at going around a racetrack in my life. And when you initially say like ninety two thousand dollars, and people go, <gasps> go to any, go to any Moto GP to be at the point where you're on the track out there, you're gonna. Be sixty deep well, how about in your this? machine pretty quick. I, I'm looking yeah. at that, and the first thing I see is that those are Olin suspension things yes. sticking yeah. out. Yeah. Yep. Those forks, and I know because my buddy crashed a bike and had to buy yeah. new ones. Yeah. Those forks and the rear shock alone is probably twenty five thousand mm -hmm. dollars at that price. Mm -hmm. So it, these are things like they're doing the things that you're going to have to do anyway. Yeah. And this um, isn't a complete factory works built SNS motor. Right. So it's going to be. Is more than no, 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 no. Wait a minute. Is that this is the FTR? That's no. Not, this is not the FTR. Okay. This is the king of the baggers. I get it. It is, is that, not. Are they running SNS on this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're they're, they're running SNS everything because SNS uh, okay. has become their in-house. What does SNS stand team. for? Do you know? I do not know. I I, I can tell you. I got that. That's a blind spot with me. Yeah. Right, That's Slippy and it, Sally, or I mean, I've, it's, I've, it's recent. I've worked on them. I couldn't tell you what it is. Right. So <laughs> anyway, uh, stinky and this slap more. Mm. this is an Indian motor that is completely S and S treatment. This is a factory built racing special. Right. It's pretty fucking cool. Uh, I I'm okay. I'm okay with it. And as much as I hated the whole King of the Bagger thing, I've started to get more interested. I'm in pumped. It. I can't wait to yeah. see it down at Mid Ohio. And I'm very excited about the idea that we're going to be able to see it. It's going to be going on while we're there. It's yeah. pretty cool. You know? I mean, and these should just be in the pits. And you yeah. should just be able That's to walk right thing. up to like In mid-Ohio, right. like, you know, you can do yeah. that. It's wide open, man. Go up and check them out. Yeah. I'm very excited about it. I think it's going to be cool. But I do hope it does things like, yeah, exactly. Well, Honda, let's, let's, let's see a VTX 1800. That's what I'm right? saying. Let's, you know, let's see BMW show up with, well, they've got their 1800, but that's a, Giant boxer motor. I don't think we're going to be leaning that over. That's a 1600 bagger. That might That's compete. true. The 16, yeah. You're right. The 1600 bagger. That's a fantastic motor. It's not a V twin. It's a no. straight six, but. Um, yeah, but still. I think it'd hold its own. I absolutely yeah, think it'd hold its own. I don't. Own. It's not limited to twins, right? No. It's just, not at all. It's just a displacement thing, I'm sure, or something. I'm sure it's a bagger thing. Yeah. Because with this type of racing, the more the merrier. That's what I would. Yeah, that's what I would right. hope. Right. Yeah. I think there's a. I think there's a. A 71 page book of suggestions they call a rule book. Mm -hmm. And that, unless somebody can say that you've egregiously divided, you know, made, gave uh, yourself an unfair advantage, probably more, the more the merrier. There, there's your answer. What's well, SNS? George answer. Smith yeah. and Stanley Stankos. Smith See? and Stankos. Stankos. Smith and Stankos. I knew it was you a got stank, it, buddy. something. You nailed it. There you go. Smith and Stankos. But, but you know, with everything, you get to win once before they outlaw you. So. You know, I you know this might it's not never be a the war crime the first time. <laughs> Ask right? Canada. Yep, that's a. Uh, but I don't see this acid dip in frames though. I'm super. I'm super excited you know, about it. I don't care. You know, if they just if they just leave it hands off, if nobody dies, it's fine. Right. <laughs> and and the whole thing is if if somebody does say you know big dick competition, yeah. I'm going to go out and spend ninety two thousand dollars so I can go out and play with the big boys. 
Cool. Yeah. Great. Let let a privateer come out. Because motorcycle companies have been selling race bikes to people for years and years and years and years. Yeah, right. You know, the RC211V, you could buy one. Well, how about this? Right. When I was at when I was at at Pitt for Moto America, right. the dude who was in first place, this is a couple of years ago for the series, on his way from Texas or whatever up to Pennsylvania, their trailer caught on fire and it burned his race bike down. So he had 24 hours to get a motorcycle together to, to make the next race. So they went, all they could do with the amount of time that they had was they went to the local Suzuki dealer. He was a Suzuki rider. He grabbed a GSX-R1000 R. They brought it in. They, they had tires. They were able to pull the tires and stuff out of the trailer. So they were able to put the slicks and stuff and their, and their wheels on it, a chain. But he basically raced the next day. Like they removed all the mirrors and the lights and all that and, you know, did that. Right. Literally, they didn't have time to put race plastics. It had the actual fucking like Jixer plastics with the light. The, the This is the dude who's in first place with the lights taped over, uh, turn signals ripped off, whatever, and he took second. Wow. So to your point, wow. Like the, yeah. the, Holy this shit. is what's kind of interesting about this bagger thing is that like the sport bikes, Not I'm not talking MotoGP. GP, right. So you, we don't need an email saying about how the amazing... I'm talking about like Moto America where they're racing pretty much stock production bikes yeah. Yeah, for the right. most part, right? With forks and upgrades like that. But like the stock race bikes are so fucking good that you're only talking a couple thousandths of a second behind the actual prepared bikes. Yeah. Like they need the prepared stuff just to get that hundred thousandth of a second to win. So like... That's what I find interesting about this is because like now you have these shitty bikes that aren't supposed to go <laughs> fast. So now they have to do all this crazy innovation to make them go faster. So it's going to get interesting. The uh, street legal Honda RC211V or the RC213V is $184,000. Wow. Well, currently? Mm, as of, no, it was 2016. Okay. I was going to yeah. say. Like, no, it, but in today's money, that'd be a lot more, yeah. right? But the point being that Honda proved that was a thing. Honda proved that there were people out there that wanted to buy a bike without a race team behind them mm -hmm. and be competitive. Mm -hmm. And so in the interest of being able to do that, they did it, and it cost $184,000 in the year of our Lord 2016. And if you right? sell this to some guy right. Right. And, and he wins, yeah. <laughs> well, it's still a win for you. It's pretty fucking amazing for you everybody. One on a Honda. It's, it's just pretty goddamn amazing. The idea of privateers being able to buy factory-built race bikes because, yeah, the factory has teams. The factory has tons of teams, yeah. and they have people that use their bikes on teams. Yeah, because yeah, the, the Desmos at HERR is 72,500. Right. 72,500, exactly. I wonder if they do, yeah, right, like, right. so Dodge yeah. sells, like, what, the Dodge Demon uh, track car or something, yeah. right? right? And it doesn't come with a title. Because it's not, it's you're not supposed. It's to... It's going to come with an off-road use only title. Yeah, yeah, right. that's what come I mean. for an off-road yeah, yeah, yeah. use title, only title. So you think um, that these are going to be the same? Well, I do know that the the Honda um, the two thirteen did was absolutely street legal motorcycle. So the uh, the two thirteen came with lights, turn signals, the whole thing. Hmm. It, it was ready to ready to put on the street. Uh, now you didn't, right? <laughs> Uh, because it's still a racing motorcycle, it still has all the support requirements of a racing motorcycle. You're right. not gonna you're not gonna go out and put forty thousand miles on that bike. I don't I don't think. Uh, but that's a that's a motorcycle that yeah. If you had one hundred and eighty four thousand dollars, you yeah. could just go fucking buy one, and it was DOT legal. Just go own it. Now there aren't too many people that were actually putting it riding on the street. It was well, the idea was you buy it so that you could go race it. Well, do you remember my buddy Mark? You remember Q? Oh yeah. Yeah. So he was like the Ducati technician, and so he had ties in. So when um, when the old uh, AMA Vintage Racing stopped, mm -hmm. the the team closed up, and he was able to buy one of those bikes. <laughs> and so you know he paid like fifty eight thousand dollars for yeah, it. Right. But he was surprised. I mean, he wasn't surprised. He knew it, you know he was he was a tech, but mm -hmm. he got it, and he actually did make it road legal. But the the gas was something like twelve ninety five a gallon because oh, yeah. I had to use like some specific. You could only use track track. Gas. yeah gas. And then it had no key. It started with a laptop and a, and a computer-controlled wheel that came with it that wow. spun up to spin wow. the back tire. Yeah, that's... So, yeah, you weren't, you weren't just going to the bar. That's a whole <laughs> different thing. You yeah. couldn't just bump start it? <laughs> now well, you have, need the laptop. You have to have the laptop. Yeah. Like you know a, what? Like, just like a Honda. I think with those things, they're running on the ragged edge so much that it's like, okay, well, we've decided 
that this back tire should be at uh, uh, 26 RPM mm. before we will engage the, the starter circuit sure. to make sure we don't get a short start yep. and push rods the way they're not supposed to be going. Sure. Right? Because oh, nobody I, wants to do that. I, on, there was a lot to it. Whoa. Um, I want to go off on a brief fucking oil thread. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. There's no such thing. Well, there is today. <laughs> are we are we talking about Rotella already? We are. Yes. In fact, we are. Um, the reason we're talking about Rotella is because it's on sale. And uh, $15? For $15. For a gallon. Oh, I, oh yeah. I'm there, dude. Oh, okay. no. T6 or T4? No, we're going to talk about that. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. All right. So... And it begins. And it begins. Well, no, I just, for the SAE <laughs> stuff. So, Please tell me the SAEs in there. I don't give a shit what the numbers are. So for all good. of you KLR guys out there listening. <laughs> no, it's not. And that's why I want to bring this up. Because have, have any of you guys discovered Bob the Oil Guy? Yes. Okay. So Bob the Oil Guy is just one of my favorite threads uh, to get into. <laughs> because if you're ever having an online battle on the You're All Forum, or on the BMW forum, or on the Triumph forum, or on the TW200 forum. KLR. Or on the KLR yes. forum. Right? DR650. Yes. I, I, Anywhere where everybody says the words, yeah. what oil should I use? And the, the, the infamous oil thread starts. Yep. And the, infam the infamous oil thread starts. And you're going to go, you know, here we fucking go. <laughs> just, just skip this. Just block this yep. entire fucking conversation. But for a long time, the way that you could win the argument was to do what our shop had done, which we used Black Hawk oil analysis. So we would do, we would send a little urine sample of the oil that came out of the motorcycle in question, mm -hmm. and we would fucking send it off, and they would send us back the results. And it would be the molecular, like, it would be amazing. It would tell you everything about the oil. All the metals in it. It everything. was great. Yeah. But also there was a little comment section. The comment section was always my favorite part because the comment section, I'm still convinced that the guy that was writing the comment section for these Black Hawk Oil analysis had been through a few of these conversations before. Oh, I'm sure. And he'd had about enough, right? So he would be like, um, Maybe change the seals in this motor. Your oil has got more gas in it than an Exxon than the Exxon Valdez or whatever, right? <laughs> um, notice on line forty three that your oil is full of bronze, and your oil is full of metal shavings. And like this motor needed a rebuild a half life ago, <laughs> right? Uh, he always put great comments in there, and so we did an oil analysis out of a Royal Enfield motorcycle that had zero miles on it, a bike that was out of the crate like literally took it out of the fucking crate i took a sample of the oil out of it and i sent it off and uh, i got my response back and they said you tried to trick me this came out of a brand new royal enfield <laughs> wow <laughs> <laughs> wow that's pretty good and i was like you're right <laughs> now tell me why He's like, yeah, because there are things that are, are in this oil that are illegal for use in the United States. There are things that they put into the oil to turn three quarts of oil into four quarts of oil, additives, that are not allowed in America, <laughs> that we don't allow our EPA to even have them in the room, right? But they use them as filler material to stretch a gallon of oil, right? And it doesn't seem like much when you're like, oh, it turns you know, three quarts into four quarts. But when you're talking about 1.6 million motorcycles and you're saving a quart, you're saving literally a quart of oil per motorcycle. Well, then every fourth motorcycle, you got a free quart of oil. And the Indians will do that, right? Uh, so these get people know exactly what they're doing. And I was at the racetrack many, 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 many years ago. And I was one of these guys that would like, I'd go out and do a race weekend and I'd come back and I would dutifully change my oil and, and all that stuff. And, you know, I would take the oil out of my motorcycle and I would put it in my Ford Ranger because my, the oil in my motorcycle had been in my motorcycle for about eight hours. Right. Right. Still good oil. Right. And I was at racing and was at SVs, uh, SV650s and I saw this guy next to me and he literally busted out a bottle of Rotella T4. <laughs> and I was like, <clears throat> you're putting your good oil in the old Rotella bottles, aren't you? 
And so, you know, people don't know what you're running. Like, you got some sneaky shit in there, and you're just putting in the Rotella bottles to throw people off. And the guy was like, fuck no, I'm running Rotella. And I was like, um, T4, I was like, I, I think I need to tell you this, but T4 is not synthetic. And he was like, no, it's not synthetic. <laughs> no, that's T6. And I said, yes, it is. And he says, well, what are you running? And I was like, a Motul, you know, expensive, 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 $19 a liter oil. And he's like, why? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like, well, because I don't want my motor to blow up. He goes, what you doing with that motor? And I was like, is it a stock? It's a stock motor. And he goes, then why wouldn't you run God's oil? <laughs> and I was like, oh, man, you're fucking with me now. And so, yeah, you can go on Bob the Oil Guy and participate in a conversation where um, the guy who knows more about oil than anybody else on the planet will tell you why this shit works. Yep. And uh, especially for some of us who have really fucking old motorcycles, if we have a really fucking old motorcycle, you don't want the blue jug. You don't need no, the blue jug. No. You don't need the T6. You don't need the synthetic. In fact, a lot of people have said that in their older motorcycles, um, the T6 is sneaking past seals and, and going places it might not should go. Very fucking interesting. But do you know what's funny about this particular oil? Is if you buy this, you don't have to buy it at Tractor Supply Company. You can buy it anywhere. But the price right now at Tractor Supply Company is fucking great. That's uh, $3.40 a quart. Mm -hmm. That's Wolf's Head money. That's, that's the fakey shit at the truck stop money. Yep. That's some seriously cheap money. And if you are the type of person that likes to change your oil seasonally, right? Well, maybe you don't need to have $30 worth of oil in your crankcase. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could have eight bucks worth of oil in your crankcase instead. This is kind of great stuff. And the more that I, the more that I went into the deep dive on it the past couple of days, the more I was like, hmm, okay. I think the podcast needs to be reminded about that. Yep. I There's, think that because the oil wars are awful. But then yeah. there's like the guys that are not participating in the oil wars. Yeah. But like they do proof of, of concept where like they they have their DR650 that they've been running T4 in since the day that they got it. Mm -hmm. and now they're at 128,000 miles, you know, and like they've documented <laughs> on Adventure Rider every day that they've <clears throat> ridden, you know. Yep. So like it's like a 348 page long thread yep. Yep. of them documenting how good the oil is. So, yep. I mean, it's out there. <laughs> Every year since 2017, the Bob the Bob is the Oil Guy forum, they will do this, and on an anniversary basis, where one time a year they will grab this thread and throw it back up again, mm -hmm. because it is funny because it's gotten a life of its own now, where it just like casually goes in and nukes oil threads, um, all over the place. But what's funny is they have now gotten to the point where they're getting into really weird technical jargon like the gaseous vapor no act tests and stuff like that and they're like okay it's a gtl but it's not of this and it's not of that and people who legitimately know about oil have entered the room yeah and they've they've got this cumulative data they've just kept adding and adding and it's all additive and it's just gotten to the point where they're just like okay well here we go and to people that ride motorcycles um at our shop we have Bell Ray and giant 55 gallon drums that we sell to our customers because the customer mindset says, I want to have motorcycle oil on oh, yeah. motorcycles. This is why everybody, this is why Motul has an existence. Exactly. Right. You know, okay. it, right. you, because right. everything, every Vespa comes with little Egypt stickers, but you can't they buy They used to. They used, oh, they still don't, they, they don't, don't know. know. They don't know, right? They don't like, know. But um, so now they have Motul stickers. Yeah. So they're, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's true. And uh, Prilly well, products. You, you want to spend $12 a core, right? Well, you got to support your dealer. Right. And uh, $12 a quart. <laughs> right. Where the fuck have you been? It's $19 <laughs> a quart. God. It's literally $19 oh. to $21 a quart right now. Yeah. It is not Inflation, I'm quart. sorry. It is really, really expensive. I promise you, tires are more expensive than you think they are, oh, and God. oil is more expensive well, yeah, than you think Well, yeah, because we were talking about Duros the other day, and they have doubled in I price. I promise Duros you. Duros have doubled. I, I, oh, man. <laughs> we, we do this shit. At the, we do deep dives on this shit at the shop yeah. all the time. And what I, what do you run in your bikes? I follow the owner's manual to the letter. Uh -huh. If I have a BMW, I put BMW oil in it. 
If I have a Honda, I put Honda oil in it. You do. And I consider it cheap insurance right. because realistically, I do one to two oil changes a year on each bike. All that oil adds up to maybe 150 bucks. Right. And I know what that bike was engineered for. I know what the oil was engineered for. I, I trust the quality control right. of BMW or Honda, wherever they're sourcing their oils. And I buy what's in the manual. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was curious about that because you do go through some oil. I do. Yeah, you go through some oil. And I'm, if if there's oil in my world, if there if there's a motorcycle that I own and you open it up, I guarantee it has Rotella in it. I actually buy my own stock because I wait until Walmart has the the five gallon or the 2.5 gallon, which actually just guy, I actually learned it was cheaper to buy it that way because they ship it for free. And so... I bought a whole grip of T6 and I bought a whole grip of T4. And if my motorcycle's over 15 years old, I run the T4. Yeah, because the, yeah. the, the surest way to, to know that you're going to have to replace your rear main seal on a mm. BMW yeah. or Moto Guzzi yeah. is to run synthetic. Absolutely. Or so, any modern oil for that matter. Guarantee. So here's yeah. the weird thing. So I, for a long mm. time, on most of my bikes would run Rotella T6 because they were mostly mm. newer. And on the yep. old ones, I'd do T4. Yep. But... um. On Amazon, man, and I hate to promote Amazon, but once in a while, to Pete's thing, like, so for my Kawasaki and my Honda, which are my newest bikes and the ones that I like a lot, um, I kind of did that. I was like, well, I'm going to put Honda oil in it, right. right? But, like, on Amazon, they'll sell a Honda oil change kit that comes with a Honda oil filter, mm -hmm. a Honda O-ring, all four oil things of gloves and it, something else. They're and a hell of a deal. But oh, it, yeah. it's almost yeah. cheaper. 30 bucks? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. It's like you almost can't not buy it. Yep. And yep. it's shipped overnight, and it's there the next day, and you're ready to go. At our shop, we've gone to the Harley-Davidson oil change kits. Oil yeah. change in a box. Oil change in a box. Yeah. And we've gone to it because when you break it down, it actually costs a hell of a lot. Yes, yeah. it is. It's and, crazy. You know, Parts Unlimited has sort of mastered that. BMW's uh, oil change kit, especially when you get into weird shit like 0W30s. Mm-hmm. When you get into zero W thirties, when you get into oils that are not going to be in your, I always joke, but the numbers between five and forty. So you're like, what kind of oil should I have in my bike? I'm like, well, anything between five and forty. And the customers just go, <laughs> and I'm like, look, the bottom number should be be between five and forty, and the top number should be between five and forty. Yep. And they still go, <laughs> and I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ, look. The bottom number is going to be between 5, 10, or 15, okay? The top number is going to be 30 or 40. You're fine. Right, and with the well, motorcycle... can I use 15 W40? You can. Do you ride when it's 19 degrees out? That's if what you I'm ride saying. when it's 19 degrees out, you probably shouldn't use 15 W40, yeah. especially if you're like in a Moto Guzzi, it's not going to want to start. Moto Guzzi uses 10 W60. But I have enough experience with Moto Guzzi's to tell you that 10W40 works fine, right? 10W60 is not easy oil to find. 0W40 is not easy oil to find. 0W30 is not. Now that we're getting into these crazy extreme viscosity oils. <clears throat> well, that's because most modern hybrids require a zero. Like they, mm -hmm. they recommend, somebody recommended one time I use a 0 40 in the, in the element. And I looked at it and went, no, <laughs> no. Well, that's the funny part, though. But like a lot of the trucks now, like my mm -hmm. dumb Dodge, yeah. now all the new Dodges are OW20. Right. Yeah. And like the, I think they realized because before they'd be like, they'd have a lot of issues. Like my truck was throwing rocker arms because it had to heat the oil up to get the oil up into the head. Why yeah. don't they just start with a thinner oil before mm -hmm. it gets to temperature? Yeah, so, absolutely. You know. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I, with the customer base that we have at the shop, I've had to learn. I can no longer give them fun, sexy, creative answers. <laughs> <clears throat> I now have to give them things like... You made like, me think, Phil. And I'm like, man, dude, uh, there's, a, there's a thing. And I'm like, give me a second. I'm going to come up with it. <laughs> read the fucking manual. <laughs> right? And I have to say that at the shop every yeah. day. I'm like, well, read the fucking manual. Well, I want you to tell me. You are too lazy to read your own manual. You want me to tell you the answer. But you understand, the error factor of me trying to remember what oil 200 different motorcycles take <clears throat> should be taken into strong consideration. Because I would rather tell you straight to your face, I cannot give you a guaranteed result. I can tell you the guidelines within which I operate. But that's religion. You want 
numbers. So open your fucking owner's manual and look inside of it. And they go, but I've never opened my owner's manual. Right. And well, it's time to start. Well, I was going to say, like, so do you, you would think that, like, so from, like, the 60s and 70s right. and 80s, when people had to actually, like, if they lost their manual, they might have to order one. Or they'd have to go to a library to get the information. <laughs> and now, in 2024, it's like whatever motorcycle right. you fell upon that yes. day, you could Absolutely. pull out your device and find out what oil to put in it in fucking one second. Yeah. Or, or, yeah. And you know what that thread's going to tell you? Rotella. Rotella. <laughs> no, 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 but, yeah. But I'm saying, are you going to go to a thread or are you going to go, you can just find the manual online or, or I'm gonna anything. Guys, I'm going to give you guys a secret tip. Have you Googled anything lately? <laughs> what? You're going to find what, right what you're looking for immediately. I need to know what oil to put in my TW200. Okay, look it up. You've got cancer. Yeah. Right. WebMD says you've got cancer, right? And you're and you need boner pills and Rotella. Right. You know, I can't I can't find the answer. I'm going to go ask Uncle Phil. Right, yep. right, exactly. I got frustrated, so I asked you. Here's the other thing: if your motorcycle is from year of 19, I think it's 79 or 80, maybe. Yeah. If you take the seat off, by law, by law, there's a tag in there that tells you what kind of spark plug you're supposed to run. It's the EPA sheet, so you have an EPA sticker in your bike. It tells you what kind of spark plug you're supposed to run. It tells you, strangely enough, what the advanced and retard timing is on the damn thing. Which you can't set anyway. Which you can't do anything <laughs> about anyway. But it also tells you what. What oil you're supposed to run. Yeah. And it literally is on every tag, every motorcycle. So when you've got a motorcycle that you bought in the United States of America, um, you're going to find a motorcycle EPA tag. And your EPA tag or EPA sticker, that's going to have that very secret, very hard to get information um, Literally on your fucking well, and, motorcycle. And think about all the old Hondas yeah. and stuff. It was pressed into the fucking oil cap. Yeah, absolutely. It would literally say yeah. 10W40 it or would, whatever. Yep. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> so stuff like that, when, you know, if you are at a loss and you're not, not sure exactly what to do, the information will be there. You just need to find it. Or open your goddamn manual. Uh, because th at least with the manual, like Steve's and saying... It, or Pete's saying it's all going to—it's always going to be right. And if you don't, for example, if you've bought your bike secondhand mm -hmm. and you don't have the manual anymore to read, right. go online. Yep. It will be there, and most manufacturers will actually have it on their website. You have to search for yeah. man owner's manual, whatever the hell you have. Sure, absolutely, and it will be there. Yeah, they, I think by law, it actually they actually have to offer reprints. It's a, it's a funny, th yeah, I think that it has to be made available yeah. to you because it is an EPA thing. It's, yeah. a, it's an EPA violation if you don't have access to it. One, uh, one more word on oil, too. Like if, if sometimes people want to put synthetic in just because they think synthetic is better than dino juice. Right. Um, if your clutch is not set up for oh, yeah. synthetic and you put some super slippery synthetic, your clutch might not work right. That's, yeah. <laughs> um, Welcome to the world of BMWs and oh, Moto Guzzi's exactly. again. Yeah. Because um, as soon as that rear main seal lets go, all that oil, no, all that it's, fancy no, I'm synthetic. not talking about that. No, I'm, I'm talking, talking about, about if you clutch. if yeah. you have a wet clutch yeah. that's supposed to be bathed in oil clutch. and you don't bathe it in the proper oil, the yeah, clutch yeah. doesn't work right. Yeah, because the oil is too slippery well, old, for the clutch. Because older Hondas would they would if you put synthetic in them they would old Vespas will, old Vespas will swell if you put the wrong oil in it. So this is off of my Yamaha TW200, yep. <clears throat> one of the most complicated motorcycles on the planet, <laughs> and. Uh, it is a tractor, right? Yep. But on this sticker, on this sticker, here's some important things that are on the sticker. First thing, it literally tells you engine oil, SAE 20W40 or 10W30. It gives you two choices, right? It tells you 91 octane research octane number, 91 octane. Now, 91 RON balances out to 87 RM2 because you have RON plus MON divided by two, okay? So if your MON number is gonna be about 84, your RON number is gonna be 91, you add them together, you divide it by two, RM2 is the method by which we determine octane in the United States, 87 octane RM2. So yay, we're good. <clears throat> so this right here is telling you not to put expensive gas in a TW200. Here's my favorite part, the valve lash. It tells you the valve lash yep. in inches and in millimeters um, on the intake and on the exhaust. It tells you the spark plug gap. It tells you the idle speed. This is not in the owner's manual. This is in a, on a sticker yep. on the motorcycle. <laughs> so it turns out if you do look for just a little bit, a little tiny bit, you're going to find out a lot of cool shit about your motorcycle, and it's literally stamped on the fucker, or it's in a sticker, right? 
I love how on the bottom, when it gives you all this information, it also says, see owner's manual. Uh, <clears throat> it'll also tell you things on there like the year of the bike, and it'll also tell you the model number for the bike. So if you're not sure, looking up stuff, always look at your motorcycle. Yeah. Look on yeah. the bike itself. Because what you're going to find is kind of shocking, all the stickers that they put on there. Unless you're somebody who takes the heat gun and takes all the stickers off your bike, in which case, go back to the manual. Yeah. It's a <laughs> like the, the amount of stickers and stamped logos and everything that's on you, the amount of information that is required. Mm -hmm. this, and this goes back to our earlier discussion about Chinese models and everything else, mm -hmm. European model bikes, is imports don't have, illegal imports don't have this yeah. information, which right. is one of the problems we run into. Yep. American market bikes have more information stamped and printed and stickered and everything. The no pets sticker right. yeah. on the Vespas is always a big joke, but that is because at one point somebody got sued over this. Somebody put a cat and somebody, in a pet carrier. I'm sure. A cat pet carrier. <clears throat> but everything, like the, the, the cat the, cooker. It, it literally <laughs> says, it literally says, pet warmer. warmer. <laughs> right in the pet warmer. But because of all of the things steps we've had to go through because the epa was created in 74 right. all of the steps that we've had to go through legally mm -hmm. is the result of why all of these stickers exist dumb people dumb people people losing but in court a, people winning in court people, right well the, did I, you ever think I don't that, think it's because we're dumb i think it's because we're litigious no but did you ever think that that's what got us to where we are right now as a country with everybody hating each other and stuff it's because the dumb people didn't die. They fucking, they didn't use, like, we lost well, a whole generation of people throwing uh, fucking hair dryers and I mean, fucking sinks and stuff, man. What's, what mean, did somebody say? It was uh, the, the absence, of the bicycle helmets. So yeah. It's like bicycle helmets and uh, mulch around the playground equipment <laughs> yeah, has, taken, has made us stupid. No, nah, you know, you know what did it? You know what finally, finally cured our society and allowed dumb people to pro procreate? They took jarts. Off oh, the shelves. Jarts. Yeah. jarts was guaranteed to take. You're going you're gonna to lose a few with Jarts. Back to those EPA stickers. I thought it'd be fun if I pulled an EPA sticker up off a brand new motorcycle. Yeah. Uh, just because this is fun. Um, here we have. <laughs> so when I was looking at the Harley Davidson, when you were asking me a question about the Springer. Yeah. And I didn't have an answer for you right away. So what I did was I immediately put my head down there and I looked at all the stickers because the whole frame of your motorcycle. Is oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, stickers, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. And I think it's fucking great that on uh, a brand new Indian Scout, that it literally tells you the intake valve clearance, yeah. the exhaust valve clearance, the spark plug gap, it's all right there. That information is there. Something that, you know, even if you're like, oh, well, you know, I, I, hey, on this motorcycle, you're gonna have to adjust the valves kind of once. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't wanna be a cock, but these are really good motorcycles. They're really nicely built. Yeah. And at about 5,000 miles, you'll, on a, you'll on see a, they need an adjustment. On an SV650, right. the service check for the valves is mm. 21,000 miles. Right. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm not joking when we talk about there are motorcycles that exist in this planet that even though they don't have hydraulically adjusted valves, that you might, might need one valve adjustment. Mm. In yep. your course of yep. ownership of the vehicle in 40,000 miles, right? You might need one. When I did my SV... I did my SV at about 15,000 miles, and I was like, man, I hope this is good because Shim and Buck is a pain in my ass. Oh, absolutely. Right? And it was fucking right on. Yep. And I was like, oh, that's pretty great. That's cool. Uh, well, my, my BMW F800 uh, gets valve adjustments every 12,000 miles. Right. It, I've done it three times, and every time it's been in spec. Yep. And that's a mm -hmm. yeah. long shin motor. And that's yep. a long shin motor. Yep. Exactly. That's a Chinese motor. That BMW's been using for a very long time. Oh, yeah. Various different permutations of it. Because we used to say, and that was the thing, we have to be careful. Tom and I have to be very careful. Because we used to say, that's a Chinese motor you got there in your Janus there, Mr. Chris. Your Janus has got a Chinese motor in it. So that means it'll be okay, but you got to change the oil an awful lot. And you got to adjust the valves all the goddamn time. Tom, how much were... Oh, the Janice's valves out oh, adjustment. They on were not both of them. They were not all. Right. And Chris Smith's. Mm -hmm. I've done three Janus motors now, and yeah. none of them were. At, they were all right in spec. And so this is a pushrod motor, yeah. 250 cc's, dragging around a Chris Smith shaped person. Yep. And he <laughs> rode it from. Oh, he's Indiana to here, and so that's you can the, understand like 
Well, that's that the these valves com- snugged up a bit. That's mm. the high compression head too. That he's got. He changed the head on. Yeah, yeah he did. Did performance yeah. mod. So he's even changed the head. So after they did that and did the torque and everything else, because yeah. I had to go through it all again yeah. because it was leaking yeah, because was leaking. the head the valve cover gasket was wrong. But even after all that, right. the valves were still in specs. Yeah. And to me, that I just want to make sure people understand that. Well, when I was doing fly, things have gotten a lot better. When I was doing fly scooter, which is when I was doing fly scooter, which was Zenan, not mm-hmm. Zong Shen, because right. I know that's a difference. But it was Zenan right. when you took them out of the crate. Same with Red Streak. Mm-hmm. You had to take them out of the crate, immediately set the valves, right. and change the oil because the oil was the shipping oil, which again, like you were talking about with the Indian, was right. cheap oil. Really yeah, bad. But really if you bad. did that, if you set the valves, if you right. changed the oil, you'd get 10,000 miles out of that motor. I totally agree. If you didn't, yeah. you would you see it at 12, yeah. 1,200. 1,200. Yeah, twelve hundred, and the top end would be blunt, yeah. burned up. Yeah, we've used to, we've actually said with some of those bikes, they would come into our shop and they'd still be on the temp tag. Yep, and the motor was fucked. Mm-hmm. And you're like, wow, that's great. You need a motor, and your temp tag is still valid. And it's it's a scary thing to see that I, that no, exists. I've been seeing posts about the new Harleys like that. A lot of people yeah, taking them so, with three yeah. and four thousand miles on uh, them, taking them in. Dan's Dan's friend, Dan's friend, his bike was one month out of warranty. Oh. Yeah, well, that's what. So I just saw this thread today of this guy. A Milwaukee eight. This guy's got two thousand miles on a twenty twenty four. He's had it to the shop four times, and now they won't talk to him anymore, and the bike won't run. No, that's getting bad, man. It's really bad, and I think that, I think that, even Harley Davidson at this point, which is this is their flagship motor. Yeah, this is the one that they were saying this is this is going to do it. This is this is going to fix it, and I'm. But I thought maybe we might have said something about this before and kind of the the problems they were having with this, but I want to revisit it. It's got exasperated or exasperated. Harley Davidson will not admit to these problems. Right. But a company that does nothing but make luggage, Viking bags, <laughs> and they make affordable fucking luggage. I don't know if you ever had any Viking bags. They're not like <clears throat> leather chrome ensconced things viking bags are work fucking they're like workman like bags they that shit's strong mm. it ain't fancy pants but it's strong shit we've put milwaukee we've put viking bags on a bunch of stuff but here's what i wanted to bring up here's a company that is not harley davidson but they make their bread and butter selling bags to harley davidson people right and since they feel like they want to be good citizens they, they feel like it might be in somebody's best interest to say, hmm, let's, let's, let's take our cumulative knowledge about the motorcycle industry, let's put it all in one place, and let's say this is verifiable information because we're talking to people that are Harley-Davidson mechanics at Harley-Davidson dealerships. We are talking to customers every fucking day, mm-hmm. and we're tired of hearing about it, so let's compile it all in one place. And they literally went through and they made a checklist. So if you go to vikingbags.com, in their blogs section, they have this amazing, for lack of a better term, guide to let you know what could be going wrong with your motorcycle and things you should be aware of Mm -hmm. to get that son of a bitch into the dealer while you're still under warranty so you don't end up like Dan's friend who's sitting there with a brick right now. Mm -hmm. And when you saw that piston on his bike, it was pretty clear that no oil was getting into that motor. Mm -hmm. And that, that piston ground itself to shit. It right? tried to become one. It, <laughs> there was no way any rings were moving anywhere on that no. thing. It was fucked. But I really do love that, um, that, yeah, that's cool. the, uh, that this company did this. And I've used this as a reference many times. They talk about the, the Milwaukee 8. They talk about the 107. They talk about the 114, right? So they're covering both ways that motor comes. They tell you all the different bikes it comes in. They tell you about the problems it's having, the oil sumping issues. There's all kinds of issues that people are doing. And I promise you, when this first started happening and we had our customers that are like, I just got a brand new Harley, but I'm having all kinds of problems with it. And people did not want to talk about, you know, nobody at the dealership would say, oh, there's a real thing about that. Nope, there's a real thing about that. Yeah. And then this guy went to the trouble of telling you, yep, the only way to resolve the Milwaukee 8's engine oil sumping problem is to install a new oil pump, which is going to be between $300 and $700, including labor costs. So it's about $700 to fix a problem that Harley-Davidson 
that came as original equipment in your motorcycle. Yeah, that's fucked up. It is you know, fucked up. You know, this goes back to my whole thing of Harley. Right. Harley doesn't exist to make motorcycles. They exist to make money. But no. Do and you know, now they're just... Isn't that every company? Well, no, no, no. Yeah. They're not even trying to build a, a competent you, product anymore. They're just putting trash well, on Let me the ask you this. Now that this is getting out and knowing that, do you think that the ones that are hitting the the floor right now are still being the old pumps put in them? So, I don't... It's not just a pump. Yeah, so if right. you read this, you're going to realize that pump oil something. Oil something is literally issue number one. Oh. Yeah. They cover seven issues in this. Okay? So... Well done. You fixed the oil pump, mm-hmm. right? That's great. You've you've made it to level two. You've made it to <laughs> level two, right? Exactly. And here's the thing: when these first came out on the forums, everybody was saying, "Well, you got too much oil in there. You got too much oil in there." And remember, with the Harley Davidson, you check the oil while the bike's on the side stand. Yes. You check the transmission and the final drive while the bike is upright. Right. And it's confusing to some people. And they were saying, "Well, the problem is." that people have too much oil in their oil bag, too much oil in their oil tank. Yeah. So they were like, okay, we don't have so much oil in there because it's wet something. So they were telling, they, <laughs> they, the internet was telling the people internet. to not have so much oil in their oil tank. Mm. So they would literally say, kind of go low on the oil. Go low on the oil. And but, make sure it's Rotella. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Phil, uh, Phil. Do you think that Harley would deny a warranty claim because it didn't have Harley Davidson oil in it? Exactly. I bet you they would. I'll bet you they would. I bet and you they would. That's exactly, exactly right. Now, transmission. I'm just telling you what the internet's telling you. Yeah. Right. In transmission on these motors, they tell you the biggest problem with the transmission is they're underfilled. Mm-hmm. So now we got two different channels. So now these people are saying there's too much oil in the motor oil, and there's not enough oil in transmission oil. <laughs> okay, wait. If you tell me that the final drive oil is going to have a different level too, I'm going to get really upset. Well, I'm glad you should ask about that because when you get to number four, right? <laughs> Now we have that. So there's this, this thing, right? This is it. And the other thing that was funny was we were talking about um, temperatures like below freezing. People have said that they've, they've hooked car batteries on really thick cables, like eight gauge cables to their Harley Davidson with a fully charged battery and they couldn't get it to start. This is this. Yeah, we we dealt with this last week. This was a that was on an old motor. That was an old. That was but if, that was a twin cam eighty eight motor. If I saw right. this many right. problems on yeah. a new motorcycle, I would not uh, buy this yeah. motorcycle. Well, mm-hmm. <laughs> there you go. So <clears throat> this is like Subaru in ninety eight. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So they're talking about you have a fuel yeah. injector problem. <laughs> you can you can modify with a booster plug <laughs> kit. Right. There's a lot of things. And when you look at the pros and cons of this engine, and this is why I want to read it because it's fucking hilarious. Oh, wait, is this the engine that comes in the sixty thousand dollars? Yes. Oh yeah. Evo yes. Super Glide. All of the above. <laughs> wow. There's a. There's the a, answer is yes. There's a pro wow. to this trash bag. <laughs> Milwaukee engine pros better overall performance. Con- cons oil something. Smooth riding experience oil leakage. Four <laughs> valves per cylinder overheating. Produces more power and torque. Cold starting problems. Good acceleration. Produces vibrations. Less noise. Produces irritating noises. Less heat. Faulty fuel pump design. Single cam chain. Faulty oil filters. Sole satisfying exhaust note. Now they're reaching. Can only be installed on a limited number of models. Comes with an assist and slipper clutch. Gear oil issues. Rubber mounted. Engine stalling. Single internal counterbalancer, improper air and fuel mixture. By the way, that one is a big deal. Oh, yeah. These guys are burning up their motor, and we saw Dan's friend's motor. Clearly died of excessive heat. Yeah. It died of heat. Uh, Clogged air filters, uh, carbon deposits and engine sludge. Uh, Engine produces clouds of smoke. Engine misfires. There's problems. There's a lot of problems. What was that Chinese company that's building the Sportster now? (laughs) No, the the one that that took all the old tooling for the old sports. No, the QJ. QJ. The QJ. Yeah, yeah, don't buy this. Buy the QJ. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I was going to say the three hundred cc Sportster that you have in your shop right now has none of these problems. Correct. But their twelve hundred cc version of it doesn't have the problems either. <laughs> so you could have it as a Sportster three hundred, but you could also have the Sportster twelve hundred. Really? You know, because it's the old Harley tooling. You know, oh, I, I used to man. joke about oh, Harley. Right, right. I used to I used to joke about Harley's being a clown shoe, but this bike is apparently a clown shoe. You know, this is that problem. This is that. The thing that Harley Davidson, I think, has always done is they've always said, 
we need the next new motor, but the, the primary operation number one is it must be bigger. Yeah. You cannot produce a Harley motor that is smaller. You will die. You'll burn in hell. <laughs> yeah. And they found that out with the V-Rod because they brought a motor out in the, the form of a V-Rod yeah. that was a 1,000 cc's, but it made all the power and all the torque and all the good things. It yeah. was great. And they brought it out, and everybody went... Thousand cc's what's that, is smaller. What's that guy, Tim Allen? How many? How many? How many inches is that? Tim Allen. A thousand cc's is smaller than my girlfriend's Sportster. <laughs> and that moment, the marketing was done. Yeah. It was over. <laughs> they could not do that. They had built a wonderful, high-performance, fun, and I've been through a couple of them. I uh, eyeballed one for a while, man. Yeah, They're and, nice. And I kind of like that motorcycle, I'll admit it. And it was really good at going, oh, you know, and it was cool. But the people, the Harley people were like, <clears throat> you did notice it was liquid cooled. Yeah, of course we noticed it was liquid cooled. That's how you make power. Liquid cooled makes power. Give me an air cooled motor, 750 cc's. Give me a liquid cooled motor, the exact same cc's. Liquid cooled motor is going to be far more powerful. Because it operates within tighter tolerances. It operates within yeah. a narrower heat range. So it's going to be better. So it's going to be higher compression. This is Yay. what everybody else has known since okay, 1957. Cool. And then the second <laughs> thing they said was, well, it's not really a, a v, v twin, is it, anymore? Yes, it is. Well, it's not push rod motor anymore. No, it's not. Because mm. that was archaic 50 fucking years ago. Yeah. Right? And, well, but it's, and they just hated it. They hated it. And the marketing department said, but it's designed by Porsche. And all the doctors and lawyers who had Harleys and Porsches still went, no, but the guys in the black leather jackets say that it has to be American. Yeah. And they literally, guys who owned Porsches and Harleys were the only people that were <laughs> going to be like, well, that's good. Porsche's good. I like Porsche. We have one of our customers debadged his... V rod completely and replaced it all with Porsche yep. badges. Mm. Pretty fucking cool. Looks well, that's, great. Yeah, that's actually a it's good idea. Pretty tight. Oh, yeah. oh, it's the it's the nine two four of, uh, of he motorcycles. Just, <laughs> he just washed the Harley <laughs> Davidson right off of it. Probably the best thing right. to do for Wash the potato juice right off yeah. of it. It was fine. But that's the thing. And yeah, so here we are, right? I Ugh. would I would I want to buy one? We talked about that Oh our, hell no. Our, you know, our our listener from I mean, last week. I mean, we've been we've, we've been we've been talking we've been talking up Harley lately, which for me is, we're just is one of those about things. Harley, that's all we're doing. Well, we're no, no, no. I mean, the, we're talking the, about the sports for the past couple of weeks. We've been talking about the value that they have become, yeah. 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 and sure. this is not a value. <laughs> well, nobody nobody in this room is threatening to buy no a one hundred seven or a Milwaukee eight. eight. Yeah, no, nobody is. Uh, Mr. Sleepy, yeah. Do you have any updates on the Springer project? Um, I mean, it's everything's ready to go. I just have to. So here's the thing. So I was going to ask you. I was going to talk to you. Um, so I got the the wiring. I'm figuring it out and finishing it in the back there. But I've noticed that there's no tunnel channel or anywhere to put any wires in there. So I was thinking about. So check this out. So check this out. I, I'm talking as much as I can talk, and I'm getting rid of as much as I can get rid of. But there's like the nubs that you have to have, right? To yeah, yeah, yeah. things. So on the outside of my my Hyundai for the last two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Um, I was buying wood, and this guy hit my trailer and knocked my trailer into my car mm -hmm. and then took off, and it was winter, and I said, whatever. So I had a hole and a dent, right? Right. Oh, yeah. So I got me some of that uh, that that weather seal or whatever you call it, uh, the slappy sauce sealer or what is it? Flex you know, seal. The flex seal. Okay, flex seal. <laughs> and I got, right. I got the flex seal tape, and I put it on my car two and a half years ago, and it is still there, and it's kept the water out of the, the little hole in the back in the trunk. So I was thinking... Once I tighten up all these wires, that might be like a nice fender insulation. Put it up there to hold the, the just the small nubs that you have to have right. in the thing. Why It'll not? give it a layer of protection. Sure, why not? Keep it out of the. Why the, not? Right. Right. Why not? So when that's done, I mean, at that point, yeah, it's, uh, that's it's, cool. It's going to be thing. That's the mirrors cool. have been mirified. Did you look into the bushings for the Springer front end? I'm starting to. You that's, should. Yeah, that's the next thing. <laughs> I got. Trust I got some feelers out on trust that. Trust me, it's not. They sell a kit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They sell a kit. And if you need me to, I think I can order that kit through for Parts Unlimited, so I'll pay for okay. it. Put a yeah. kit on yeah. that bitch. Yeah, I think I think maybe we should do that. I think I should open up my drag specialties yeah, we'll book do it. and get you that kit. Because um, <laughs> it's a little wiggly. Well, it just makes it so much better. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 
Um, you want to see the Springer, you don't want to hear the Springer. Right. Right? Well, and that's the thing. Like, I, I was expecting Zertz fittings, and there isn't. So I was like, well, I guess we're doing bushings. <laughs> bushings as it is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, listener mail. Listener, oh, oh I love mail. Oh, listener you missed mail. last year, John. I, I, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go on. Say, I'm gonna go on the record right now and say I think we're gonna get some mail over the oil issues too. Yeah, we are. Oh yeah, so that's gonna yeah. be. Yeah. It's, good. It's, it's bait basically. Yeah, well, here's exactly. what's gonna happen. Here's what's gonna happen. The word's gonna get out, and people that have never listened to the podcast, it's gonna be like the Joe Rogan thing with everybody that gets mad that doesn't listen to it, and they say it's the. You're just gonna get guys that just were told that we talked about oil. Right. So they still haven't listened to the yeah. podcast, but your 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 email is going to be sent at a, at, a, at a broadcast level out to all the oil aficionados just to attack the podcast right. and talk about oil. Right. Johnny Mac, hey. what town in PA did you grow up in? That's personal information right there. It's okay. It's a podcast listener. I don't live there anymore. It's a Patreon. Yeah. Okay. So you can feel free. Um, what you find at my home that I grew up in, you might not like because it'll be my <laughs> older brother. And... and <laughs> He is also a force to contend with. Yeah, he is. So good luck. But I grew up in the town of North Apollo. North Apollo. Apollo. Is there a South Apollo? There's an Apollo. There's a regular Apollo. And there's a North Apollo. Okay. Yeah. All right. All we're, right. We're up above the junkyard. <laughs> you, I live just above. <laughs> were you snooty because you guys blows, were the right? North? <laughs> were the North Apollians snootier? Uh, North Apollo might be a little nicer than Apollo proper. Oh, really? Yeah. Good to know. We're, 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 we're up the hill a little bit. A little, yeah. Up the hollow. And I'm telling you, that is apropos to nothing. That is literally <laughs> a, that is a podcast listener question. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But I'll there, throw that shit out there. And in, in Apollo, there is Astronaut Way and a bunch of stuff like that. And oh. We, and we celebrate the moon landing celebration. There's a little, you know. So was Apollo named... I don't think so. After the space program? I don't. Or, I don't, I don't, or somebody's like, let's just lean into it. I, I think that's more of a lean in. As I opposed think, from going the whole have, Greek thing, we're going to go. I think we, I'll have to look that up. But I think, I think the, Apollo was always named Apollo. But, you know, in the Pittsburgh area, there's also Moon Township and some other but see, stuff. I think in the 60s, they were sitting there with this town called Apollo. Yeah. And they were just like, man, I don't, we, we're going to need something to. To really so, bring some revenue in here. Yeah. And they turned on the TV and they're like, and the next moon mission is going to be named Apollo. And they were like, yes, That's fine. We are in. Apollo sits on the Kiski Minicus River, which oh. is one of the fastest flowing rivers in Pennsylvania. And you grew up swimming in that thing? It was radioactive. <laughs> <laughs> and that explains a lot. <laughs> Did you dip? Yes. Well? And yes. <laughs> no, yes. actually, nobody ever, nobody ever swam in it. I did walk across it one time. I think my mom was trying to get us killed in 76 or something like that. It froze over, and we walked out on it. Had we broken through that, we would have been gone. Have been gone. Gone. Just well, it, moving out. You know, that really explains a lot of shit, because if you've ever met John's dad, he's four foot seven. So, <laughs> uh, I, uh, could be an issue. Just call me ET, the extra testicle. <laughs> I have three testicles. The uh, no. so that that was for, first one. Just just randomly. Yeah. Um, hey, Moto Degenerates. This is Marshall from North Carolina. I'm hey. finally going to make to VMD this year. Yes. I got my camping pass and everything. Any chance you could share some hints and tips for first time attendees on the podcast? Um. Looking forward to meeting you clowns. I think we have videos. We have a lot. past shows. A lot. I'm sure we'll do another we one do it, soon. We do an AMA Vintage Days follow-up for like yeah. the past 12 years. And then about four weeks before, we right. start to get into the gear. And Your mode. music video was awesome after that. So it yeah, really, really Oh, yeah, so, yeah. The, yeah. That, yeah. the that, music video is probably That was the way to go. We're going to have to redo that. that, too, for this year with everybody. I think we can. Stuff. Yeah, we, we absolutely can. We can have... But yeah, harmony. But I would say in about what four weeks beforehand, yeah. we give a pretty good right. breakdown and stuff, getting ready. But he's but, got the main things covered. He's got the things he needs for now. Yeah. Okay, so here's what he needs for now. He needs a small bike to ride around on, mm -hmm. for or sure, to be able to get one when he gets there. Sure. So either have one being brought for you or have one going in. Right. You don't want to be on foot there. No. Oh no. It's it's not a bad walk, but it's not one everybody wants to do. No. If I do that walk one time, <laughs> that's too many. No, and and plus, you're just missing. Yeah. You're missing yeah. everything. Right, you're missing everything. You're well, spending all that time well, traveling. But the walkers would say, no, you're missing everything riding well, around. If you the, really the, want to cover everything, you really got to walk and get the down there. The deals because, are in the middle aisle, I'm not going to lie. But here's and the thing. And you miss those when you're riding past them. This is what the, you can beat in a walker's argument in a second. 
because you say you're missing, but like, unless you like, okay, unless you're the 10 year old kid that rides from four in the morning until four at night, right. like yeah. if you're a normal person, you're usually just riding to somewhere to go right. watch something right? Like, or talk or do whatever. So that really comes down to the swap meet. There are old yeah. codgers who are like, you got to walk it if you want to find anything. And that's right. Honestly, I don't really want to find it. <laughs> that's why I go in there every year. I do year. have a lot of stuff. I'm trying to lose things. With one thing, one thing. And if I see that one thing, I'll probably buy it. Right. But if I don't, then I'm not buying shit. Then I'll get it off of eBay. Right. And you know thing. what else? Yeah. This year, there's going to be a super strong fo- focus on emptying the warehouse. Yeah. So... I thought I had a bunch of shit, and then he showed up, and <laughs> he's going to have to have his own fucking yep. boots because he's got a lot of crap, too. Yep. So uh, we, we're going to have to be renting trailers to take with us behind trucks yeah. to mid-Ohio so that we can offload stuff. And I'm going to have to spend a lot less time getting sunburned in the booth, or I'm sorry, getting drunk in the tent, the FEMA camp, and I might have to actually be out selling shit for once. You know? If I don't move bikes before, then I'm probably taking a bunch you, myself. You know, exactly. you know, I'm gonna say I'm gonna put this out there. Yeah. And she she has offered it already. We put Becky in the booth. Good. Because Great. she has no emotional interest in any of it. That's she true. wants it all gone. Yeah. <laughs> She's the best person to sell it. Oh yeah. That's and then her. we go back to the law of the five dollar tarp, <laughs> the ten dollar tarp, and the items you have to take when you buy something from yes. the five or the ten dollar tarp. It's perfect. Nobody leaves empty handed. Her, her goal is to get rid of all of it. She Good. can care. She can care what it is. Perfect. She's on the. She's on the clock. She's right? on the clock. Okay. So that's cool. But that was really good. Now we have a new <laughs> Patreon at the legend level. The fucking Uh-oh. legend. You get all the jokes. Oh fuck yeah! And and he's and he's coming in swinging. Okay. All right. He's, he's Renee this week. Renee has, there's been massive box stuff. Stuffing a lot of boxes. Uh, this week has been a lot. We've got a lot of outgoing. She's going to be sore stuffing that box. So much box stuffing. So much box stuffing. So but anyway, you here build we go. up a tolerance after a while, don't you? She's, busy. A, she's got a lot of other shit she has to do. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. when she's getting told, like, you got to stuff box on the clock. Okay. <laughs> Elliot. 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 Elliot Dumont. Hey guys, super stoked to finally be able to contribute to this podcast. Hell yeah. Y'all have been part of my very new motorcycle career every step of the way. My employee and I rock out to you guys on Sundays while we wrench on bicycles. I own a bicycle nice. shop in old dry heat capital of the world, Tucson, Arizona. Mm-hmm. Your advice and general shenanigans have inspired me to get after it on the moto. Mm-hmm. I have a Royal Enfield Himalayan and I use the shit out of that thing. From delivering bicycles for the shop, Touring with my girlfriend or just getting into silly fun out in the desert. I do have a technical question for you. What are your thoughts on riding at high RPM or riding at lower RPM? Should I be spending more time at the high end of the tachometer or not? Is it good or bad for my engine? Thanks for doing what you do, and I'll get a bottle of Delback whiskey headed your way shortly. Cheers, you filthy bastards, and ride fast and take chances. (laughs) Elliot and the crew at Roadrunner Bicycles. Okay, so first of all, Roadrunner bicycles, so they're probably. Fa- so I went riding. I used to go to the Tucson thing for work because they have the Tucson aerobatic shootout. So it would be like this big RC airplane thing in the desert. Okay. But when I was racing bicycles and I wasn't the broken heap that I am now, I had friends that would have bikes out there. So we'd go bicycle, like we did road riding and also um, off road or uh, uh, mountain biking. Oh. But they have a thing, and I'm, I'm sure he'll know what we're talking about. It's called the Thousand Year Trail. And it's like a cow path that's at the top of Mount Lemon, and it comes down. So, like, you take this thing all the way up, and it's basically like a bobsledding track okay. for a bicycle. So, like, thousands and thousands of years of cows walking down the hill has created this bobsledding track that comes down the whole mountain in the, really? in the stone. So, Shit. the dude that took me was like, stay behind me. Do not pass me. Do not go faster than me. There'll be times when we're going fast. Stay with me. But if I start slowing down, slow down. I was like, okay, you know. Yeah. Well, so I'm behind him. I argue and, with that. But like, we're in this like you know bobsledding thing, and so you can't even see out of it. So we're just raging and going up on the sides, and we're doing like a pretty fast clip. And then he starts to slow down. I'm like, oh, oh, gotta slow down, right? So then we come around this turn where he's slowing down, and then there's no right side to the path anymore. Oh. Like the bobsledding thing is still going, but the whole right side now has broken out, and you have the trail under your feet, and then like an 800 foot drop to your right. Yeah. Shit. And I was like, you could have led with that. Like yeah. that just slow down and follow me. And then we went for a road ride out there and he, and they were like, okay, we'll meet here at 4 a.m. And I was like, 4 a.m.? 
And it's like, yeah, we want to get in the 100 miles, so we're going from 4, because you have to be done by 8.30 in the morning, because by 9, it's like 103 degrees. Yep. So, but it's beautiful, man. And that's where, when we're talking about sand outside, right. on the mountain bike, that's when I first learned about sand dips. Yep. As I launched over the handlebars into a fucking jumping cactus ah. that's stuck into my face. But anyways, yeah, I love that area. Great there place. You, there Tucson you go. There is. Roadrunner <laughs> Bicycles, 520-790-9394. 790 in uh, over 400 bikes in I, stock. I actually, yeah. as a counter That's to this, before, cool. we, before we get any further, because I know where Johnny's going to go with this, but before we go any further, I'm I not might, going anywhere. I might need a bicycle recommendation because I have threatened to buy a bicycle once the weather gets a little bit warmer to ride the one mile to work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I'm being serious. Like, I need the exercise because I'm getting... Yeah, well, I, I mean that's a yeah. nice walk. I and mean, I've walked that. I've walked that several times now. Yeah. You've, you know, now that you're over here, it's actually good. They carry Giant Live Momentum Birria, or Birria, Aventon, and Big Sur. So uh, they have they have got many bicycles. At nice, this, at Tom. This you seem like shop. a longboard kind of guy. I, oh I, I <laughs> no, I don't think so. I've, I've been thinking about a, a nice, inexpensive right. hybrid, but. But let's Getting go back, back to the to motorcycle. Tech. Yes, I was going to say, let's yes, sorry. circle let's back, back to, to Mr. Elliott's question. Okay, <laughs> number one, kudos to you for delivering bicycles on your Himalayan. Absolutely. Yep. We've yep. seen, probably everybody's seen some sort of motorcycle. I'm wondering yeah. if he's just doing like a mount off the back, yeah. or is he going, hey, probably, I'm hoping you're not doing a sidecar. Please don't do that. Yeah. But if you are, that's fine. I've, I've seen a couple of bicycle mounts on bike, on yeah. motorcycles there's, before. There's, so. it's, it's doable. Yeah. yeah. I think that's... Mm. We've we've got customers that come into our shop on Vespas that have mount, yep. they have kits for road bikes, mm -hmm. yep. you know, and they've got a setup so that they can fuck off, and then when they get out where they're going to go, they unload the road bike and go do the thing, mm -hmm. and then they come back. And so if it works on a Vespa, it'll work on yep. a Himalaya. But I'm going to say for the RPM question, a Royal Enfield is not a high strung machine. Nope. I'm going to say keep it in the lower refs. That'd be my, that yeah. if that There's, were my bike, that's how I'd ride it. Phil, mm -hmm. Phil and I are of the, of the same mind on this because we've both said that Stellas are a good example. Mm -hmm. Where Indians love low RPM, high MPG. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're talking about Royal Enfield, which has been the same thing for mm -hmm. decades, yeah. low RPM, high MPG. Yeah. But but there was a whole so that Fort Nine dude mm -hmm. Ryan from Fort yeah. Nine did a whole video about RPMs and motorcycles. And he said that a lot of people do ride, they're lugging their bike actually too <laughs> low, and sometimes that can cause more damage than revving it out. Remember, though, he was riding a super small displacement two-stroke. <laughs> yeah, right. But right. nobody talked about Not, it. He talked about oh, different yeah. kinds of bikes. I get yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I absolutely get it. I don't know. I mean, uh, part of an engine running is running the oil pump. So if you're running it too low, you're pumping less oil. So... I wouldn't say you want to run it too low or too high. I would just, you want to be in a comfortable thing, like keep it, you don't want to be blipping, I don't even, I'm assuming a Himalayan has a rev limiter at some point. I yeah. Mean, it's going to sign off, so you shouldn't really be over to over rev it, but you don't really want to be at 100%. Yeah. You know, uh, it, and it depends on what you're riding in too. You guys all talked about sand. Lugging it through the sand might not be as, you might have to keep some RPMs just so you're not stalling it or, or getting bogged well, down. Oh, yeah, down. I was about to say, like, if you have a soft substrate underneath you, you're going to want better throttle. Like, if you're at 2,800 RPMs and lugging it, you're not going to get the throttle response to get your tire back up or out of a, a problem, you know? I mean, going. There you up, go. That's what you need right there. That's what I want. There you go. Up. It's almost like I've been doing this for Oh, all God. Years. Okay. So this is what we, we brought up for our folks at home is we brought up the horsepower and torque chart from a Royal Inn. Field Himalayan, and it makes twenty-one horsepower at no shit eighteen hundred RPM. So it makes twenty-one horsepower at eighteen hundred RPM. It drops off twenty-five hundred or so, and then all the way up till six thousand RPM. The, the the horsepower curve is just flat. Okay, yeah. it doesn't change. This motor has. 7,500 RPM to give before the piston jumps out of it. Yeah. Okay? So this is not a high revving motor. Yeah. This is, these are Vespa numbers. Yeah, yeah. Okay? With 21, you're that's, double a P200. That's NC700 numbers right there. Yeah. So, but what I want to call attention is the maximum hearse purrs is all the way up there at 6,200 RPM. And that's 21.81. But even at its starting horsepower at 2000 off idle it's still 20 fucking horsepower yeah so if you 
believe in the theory that horsepower is how fast you hit the wall, torque is how far you move the wall, right? This bike's horsepower curve, it doesn't matter how many RPMs you're doing. It really doesn't. Look at that thing. It yeah, is it's, literally a flat line. Yeah, as soon as you turn okay. the throttle, you got all of it. Exactly. <laughs> the, the, the second you come off idle, even at idle, it's 18 horsepower. Yeah. Okay? Now, it does the torque climb. There is no more torque to be had out of this motor than the magic number that everybody should have memorized, 5252. Because at 5252, the way, horse, the way dyno charts work and the way horsepower works, it's a mathematical formula. And at 5,252 RPMs, the numbers always touch. Now, I don't care whether you're riding a Harley Davidson or you're riding a Ducati. At 5,252 numbers, at 5,552, the numbers always touch. Mm -hmm. Because that's the mathematic formula that brings you to horsepower and torque. With torque, you can determine horse horsepower. With horsepower, you can determine torque. It's a mathematical formula. We don't use Newton meters in this country. We don't use kilowatts in this country. We probably should. It would make life a lot easier. Yep. But this motorcycle has absolutely nothing to give you after 5252. So the harder you're revving it, the more heat you're making. So, eh. so Especially your torque, if you're in a hot... Your torque air, drops off dramatically yeah. on this bike after 5252. Now, on, there are a hell of a lot of motorcycles where your torque continues to go up after 5252. Any inline four Japanese sport bike in the world but your horsepower will start dropping, right? But those numbers are going to cross, okay? The numbers are going to touch each other at that because that's the mathematical formula to get horsepower. It's, if, it's fun. If you do some research into that, you'd be like, oh, okay, well, great. Because if somebody ever tells you, at, you know, at 5252, my horsepower was 78, but my torque was 48, I'm like, you're lying because that's not how math works, right? Math has to math. So with this motorcycle, there's no reason for him to ever go over 5,200 RPM, because although he may be experiencing a less than one horsepower bump in horsepower, he's experiencing two plus foot pounds loss. So he's losing torque pretty dramatically. It's The torque is dropping off pretty quickly after 5,200 RPM on this Yeah, bike. that's a pretty steep curve. Pretty there, steep actually, curve, right? Yeah. <laughs> it goes down as fast as it came up. Oh, yeah. Right. So it goes down as fast as he came up. So... This would this bike this sheet tells me that the money shot on this bike is at five thousand RPM. Yeah, I was gonna say, say like, if, oh, go ahead, sir. I was gonna say, looking at that chart, if that was my bike, yep. I would ride it between idle and five thousand. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No yeah. reason for to cruising, ever rev it beyond five thousand. And for cruising, look, you're like, I usually cruise honestly on most bikes between thirty eight and forty five. That's mm -hmm. like my cruising thing, right. you know, whatever. And if you look. Even if he cracked the throttle all the way to the top right. at forty three, you're at the you're where yeah. you would be at max. It. Yeah, you're done. Exactly. Shift. And, shift. Right. shift, 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 and that and that does. If you do buy into, you know, I don't. I have no idea about what this particular motorcycle's gear ratios are. I I don't know. I don't care. But I know that with most motorcycles, we can generally buy about a one thousand RPM mm -hmm. gap between gear to gear to gear to gear to gear. Different bikes are different, but we play along at home. If this guy shifts at six when he's in a hurry if he's in a hurry and he shifts at six and he drops to five he's still right in the meat and potatoes he's yeah. right where he needs to be yeah so if he's in a hurry and he's boogieing along and he wants to make magic happen i wouldn't shift ever above six thousand rpm yeah doing that yeah he's not right. you're, not, anything, you're not getting right. anything you're not getting anything at it because if you shift at seven thousand i don't think this motor's gonna let you shift at 7500 i think it's pretty well spent at that point or it's got a rev limiter but uh, there's a reason the chart stops at 75. Yeah. Right? Yeah, because the, these charts can go as far as they need to go. But anyway, it is a very good question. And yep, and your particular motorcycle, it it's probably, like Tom is saying, it is probably... Shift, shift early, shift often. Dude, I, <laughs> this motorcycle has a horsepower... <clears throat> strange starting horsepower at yep. 2,000 RPM. It's, well, okay, no, no, let's look at this. It suggests a family of five. Yeah. Because in, in in a maximum fuel saving situation, Indian they, market stuff, and this is a Royal Enfield from, from they've have adapted for American markets is an entirely different beast. Okay, so talking a little bit about fuel economy. So if you want really really good fuel economy, what you want is a lot of torque and very little horsepower. Yep. So if you have a whole lot of torque and you have very little horsepower, you have a Honda Parallel Twin Seven Hundred motor, right? That's what they do. 
and you're going to get really good horsepower or really good uh, miles per gallon on it. And you can see that this motorcycle does in fact have a very offset ratio to give you great horsepower at Super low RPMs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look at it. It's almost telling you to... And there's no torque to come with it. Yep. No, but it's either. almost telling you, like, if you're around the city, I would be at, like, 2,800. Yeah. See that peak, that mm -hmm. dropping little right. sucker right there? Yep. So I thought that was an interesting chart to bring up for his case. I think yeah. it's a really good... I mean, that's a good practical use example for a guy who actually has that real motorcycle. Some, somebody, want, that somebody once told me, when I, because of, this was in, in reference to the Bajaj four strokes. Mm-hmm. Says what Indian what the Indians will do in their home is they will start off in first, and as soon as the bike is rolling, change gears. You go to fourth. Yep. There is no second. There is no third gear. It is all first and then fourth gear, and you lug it up to speed. Who's um? And I have no idea who told me that, but it's it's been in my the back of my head for ages. So who here has ever ridden a um, motorcycle that had a rotary gear shifter? So when you got to the top gear, you clicked it again, it went right back to neutral. So neutral, one, oh. two, three, four, yeah, neutral, the, the, one, the, two, three, my fly, four. My Fly Scout had that. Okay. A lot of the Honda clone motors have those. Yeah, yeah. Bingo. Yes. That's exactly right. The Asian markets, your Fly Scout, yep. your Asian markets have that. And the reason they have that is because you're commuting and you're ripping up through the gears and then you got to stop. You're ripping up the gears and you got to stop. You're ripping up the gears. So rather than going up three clicks and then going back down three clicks... You just go up three clicks and then go one more click, and that puts you right back, right in, back in first. Your shifter drum just keeps going just around keep and around. Going around yep. and around and around. And that's why in places that shift early shift often, that pays. Because then you can go one, two, three, four real fast, and then instantly one more click be back to zero again. And that's the idea of stop and go, stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. I'm and you're never... You're never Kissing the gears down, I'm, shifting on the way down. I'm sorry. I, I said fly scout. I should have said the dick. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, I thought it'd be fun just to pull up for, for the sake of shits and giggles. It'd be fun to pull up the Suzuki motorcycle dyno chart for Suzuki's comparable motorcycle, which would be, be the DRZ 400S, which is also a off-roady motorcycle, right? That has existed since Christ was a private. Uh yeah. It's, it's 400 cc's as well. So I thought it'd be really cool to uh, bring up this chart to compare it to the... Um, it's probably very much the same. It's no. probably very similar. It's probably <laughs> almost identically the same chart. Hmm. Whoa, wait a second. That is not the ch same chart at all. That chart couldn't be any more goddamn different than that Royal Enfield Himalayan chart. Yeah, it's got about 15 more slappers on there. It's got a lot more herspers, as they say, right? There's a whole lot more herspers. But more importantly, notice that at the low RPMs, there's not that, they're not that, that, not that gap. gap. So at low RPM, right, this low speed, that motorcycle has got no horsepower or torque. But look, I don't think the lines touch it, the 52-52 thing. Is, um, when you look at this, it's not RPM, it's speed. Oh. This is an old style chart that does speed, not RPM. Yeah. Uh, so we're not looking at uh, RPMs on this one. We're looking at speed. Nice, so nice this too. is a rolling. This is a rolling road dyno style. Nice. But the point being just the same though that if we look at it at low speeds, our torque and our horsepower are also very low, and then they go up progressively. And what do they do? They have a perfect. They're basically synchronous. They're basically in line with each other the whole way up. That is the opposite of what the Enfield is doing. The Enfield is going no power. No horsepower, shit tons of torque, or horsepower, no torque whatsoever. I just like the Pretty fact that you turn the key and you got 20 horsepower. Yeah, yeah. right? Like, it's just yeah, there. Right. Well, it's yeah. because it's like a generator mode. Yeah. yeah. Just like that. Giant flywheel. It, 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 I was going to say, yeah what, yeah, what size is the flywheel on that right. thing? Yeah. <laughs> if it's anything like the 500, it's huge. It's, John, like a, it's it, a 25-pound metal like, the plate. <laughs> dumbbell. It is the most ridiculous thing Hand of God, I, I looked at that flywheel and I was like, why? Why the fuck did they do that? that well, so this crazy. goes this goes back to the Indian market, though, where they're yeah, they looking go a for half that. A mile an hour. Exactly. Look, look, they're look, look, looking look. for that lugging. The crank was high, supported high MPG. It had two different bearings. It was like a, a ball bearing on one side and then mm -hmm. a roller bearing on the other. It was yeah. funky. Yeah, I, I, I will pull up uh, just because they, we have it accessible to us very quickly. I'm going to bring up a traditional... Uh, I'm going to bring up a traditional chart, uh, a dyno chart, so you guys can see it, what it looks like in its natural format, the way it should be. 
uh, for that DRZ. Because the DRZ, uh, you're going to see, there you go, there's there, the chart. There's your 52. So your 52, 52 is there, just like it says, math always maths, uh, math always wins. And when you look at this bike, yeah, it doesn't build anything resembling, you know, really cool torque, <laughs> right? Really, really cool torque uh, until you're in that, there's this really sweet spot at 6,000 RPM. And then the torque just starts falling off. I mean, falling the fuck off as the horsepower continues to climb. And that's fun. I mean, that's, that's going to be a neat thing because you're not digging anymore. And if you look at that, that's over too, you got your horsepower between, say, 6 and 9, 6,500 mm -hmm. and 9 grand. So you operate that one at relatively high revs compared right. to the Himalayan we just saw. Exactly. Which doesn't pay you a nickel to go over 5. And that's yep. the difference in the charts. Yep. Yep. When he says, should I be running at low RPMs or should be running at high RPMs? If he was riding a D Dr. Z, if he's riding a DRZ 400S, right? then he's got a whole fun zone that exists over 6,000. Plus, I mean, like when you're on a bike... But his bike won't go over 7,000 RPMs. No, no. But, but when you're on a bike, it kind of tells you where it wants to be, too. Yeah. Like when you're on the highway, like you'll know if like if you're trying to go... If, if you want a nice, smooth ride, you'll find what speed is for and that bike. These are bike. both four-stroke singles. Yes. Yeah, yeah, like, right? You will find like yeah. what where it wants to be a it lot is. of times. <laughs> Great example, though, comparing a Himalaya to any other four-stroke single yeah any other four-stroke 400 cc single because his bike does have unique personality yeah that you're not going to find in an xr you're not going to find that in a in a dr you're not going to find that in bikes that are meant to be out in the out no this spraying gravel around the suzuki i, I can always say one of the things i always wanted to do was like i wish that like when we had the 500s mm -hmm. i'm like this would be a fun bike to off-road if you lightened it up and put some yeah. knobbies on it yeah. because it's a fucking tractor. It is I mean, a you, tractor. You could definitely right. have some fun with it. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Like the DR, you're not you're not letting the clutch out at zero and then just going at one oh, RPM in the, that. the parking lot. Yeah, it's gonna that. It's going to stall. Now, I will say, at less than 3,000 RPM, you already have 15 foot-pounds of torque, yeah. which is which that Royal Enfield didn't get to 15 foot-pounds of torque until it was over 5,000 RPM, right? So when we think about like how quickly the DRZ goes from five torques to 15 torques, that is a rocket ship ride. Well, but look at the first, the but first I'm saying, but if thousand this, RPM. This glass weighs more than the flywheel. Exactly. The DRZ. It does. It really, it's a light <laughs> switch. It's an absolute fucking light switch. So the, the weight of the flywheel probably has the most bearing on that. Yeah. It probably does. And again, it's what's, it, what's the bike built to do? So if the bike is built to climb the Himalayas in first gear with the clutch out, right, and to be slow enough that you could get off the bike, go get a loaf of bread, and get back on the bike <laughs> while it's in first gear with the clutch out, right. you're good. Yeah. Right, you're fine. Yep. Never shift. You save <laughs> gas that way. Pretty interesting thing. Pretty interesting when you look at it. So yeah, that was a uh, that was our uh, our our mail. Yeah, we we do get mail. So uh, and not all fun. not all of it's hate mail. Which no, is nice. it's pretty fun. It was but nice. John, it was refreshing to get. John's going to be depressed. It's to not hear. a big it's not a big surprise that you you're not going to want to wring the tits off of a Himalaya. Right. No. But you're going to be sad that we we had. We a can big... tell you that we can tell you the head gasket it failed on every single Royal Enfield 500 that somebody tried to wring their tits off. Mm. Of. Yeah, those things didn't need to have a seal on there. Like, they didn't need to have a tattletale that told us if you were abusing your bike. We knew. <laughs> <laughs> the oil came out. But we had your favorite guy. We talked about him last week. Oh, we yeah. Were here. It was sad. Yeah, I got, to, I got to answer his tech question. Dude, he was looking for you, though. Yeah. He was asking for you, but you, were, you abandoned us for Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, Matt Davidson had some, had some concerns, but... Dave Matheson. Dave Matheson. <laughs> 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 yeah, he's, he's clued in on that. Yeah. <laughs> Was we fun. had a little bit of fun at his expense. Yeah, we sent him a tanuki, uh, but the, uh, but yeah, he was saying that on his particular Honda Dream. We talked about it, but I want to just mention it again. Dream two hundred and fifty mm -hmm. gets it up to the top of the red, like pulling first gear, right? Mm -hmm. Pulling first gear, pulls the clutch in, right, to go for second. Mm -hmm. But instead of the the RPMs coming down between one and two, they still keep going up. Wow. Yeah. I know exactly what that problem Go is, ahead. but let's wait till next week to talk about it. <laughs> and on that note. <laughs> hey, everybody, remember to ride fast and take chances. Play us out of here, John. 
Take 